Hello, everybody. Uh, I would like to welcome you uh, all to this annual European Sepsis Alliance meeting. And I know for sure that we uh, have an interesting afternoon ahead of us. Uh, my name is Ulrika Knutsson, uh, and I am co-founder of uh, Sepsis Fonden, uh, which is a Swedish sepsis trust that we started in 2015. And we have since been working on increasing awareness around sepsis in the general public in Sweden, as well as with our politicians and the, in, within the Swedish healthcare system, and of course, raise money for research around sepsis. We are also, of course, a part of ESA and uh, work closely together with this organization. And my uh, fellow co-founder and um, chairman of Sepsis Fund, Dr. Adam Linde, is part of the ESA board with uh, responsibility for the coordination of the European Research Workgroup. So today we will talk about uh, how we can, in a more cohesive way, uh, integrate sepsis into Europe's health systems. And by doing so, uh, enhance their uh, preparedness and their resilience when it comes to sepsis. Uh, many European countries have made huge advances when it comes to the care of sepsis patients, but unfortunately the general attention offered to sepsis is still rather poor, and uh, this undermines the efforts to improve its prevention, its recognition and management, which in turn, uh, of course, is costing many lives. And the COVID-19 pandemic has furthermore put new focus on sepsis, uh, since most patients admitted in the ICU with COVID-19 progress into viral sepsis, making sepsis the main cause of death in this pandemic. So today we will discuss how sepsis management can contribute to resilient healthcare systems. And we will also talk about the lack of knowledge and about sepsis, uh, the, the lack of knowledge about sepsis and how we can address that and the importance to support sepsis patients in their recovery. And I would also like to announce that today uh, ESA launch, uh, launched their first uh, European sepsis report, which is an overview uh, of the fight against sepsis in Europe. Uh, it shows that there are many uh, advances since the WHA resolution in 2017, but also that uh, only a few countries are taking concrete actions and many more should follow. So please go and have a look at this new report on the ESA uh, website uh, and, and please let us know and send com comments or, or questions around this, this report. And also before we start uh, with our first speaker, I would uh, like to let you know that you can all uh, use the chat box um, uh, to send your questions to speakers. Uh, and if the time allows it, uh, we will address these questions. And please, if you put a question there, speci specify to whom your question is uh, addressed. And for the speakers and panelists, I would just like to remind you that please mute when you're not talking and just unmute when you want to be heard. Now, uh, I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Hans Kluge, who is the regional director uh, for uh, WHO Europe. This will be a recorded talk since Mr. Kluge unfortunately couldn't be here in person. He is busy preparing for the WHO European Regional Committee, but uh, he was keen uh, to be present today somehow uh, to show WHO's continued support to ESA uh, and the sepsis issue. So please stay tuned to this message from Hans Kluge. Dear members of the European Sepsis Alliance, friends and colleagues, it's an honor to address you on this occasion. Your aim to increase awareness about sepsis in the WHO European region and that stimulate policies that prevent and impact sepsis is close to my heart. Globally, sepsis is to blame for 11 million early deaths per year of which 700,000 occur in our region. Sepsis largely impacts the most vulnerable, particularly children and those living in poverty. Sepsis is a challenge even in the most developed countries. 
ensuring that patients receive safe, high-quality care is at the center of WHO's efforts to achieve universal health coverage. Simply put, if we do not give patients and health systems the tools to prevent sepsis, we will not achieve universal health coverage. We will continue to fight for it, and this will also be our focus when marking World Patient Safety Day next week on September 17. The European region has seen significant progress in recent years, but the numbers are still too high, and the deaths that still occur are for the most part avoidable. WHO Europe is gradually but firmly increasing its focus on quality of care and patient safety, something that is of vital importance to prevent and handle sepsis. This follows the acknowledgement that there is significant room for improvement in our region. Fragmentation, poor continuity, supply-induced overconsumption, underuse, inappropriate use, suboptimal effectiveness, insufficient patient safety are all prevalent across the region, exacerbated by COVID-19, a disease that has underlined the importance of taking bold action on sepsis. Health systems must consider a range of interventions when improving quality of care, notably by enhancing clinical practice, setting standards, engaging and empowering patients and families, improving education of health workers, managers and policymakers, establishing continuous quality improvement methods, performance-based incentives, legislation and regulation frameworks. Earlier this year, together with the government of Greece, we opened the first WHO office, fully focused on quality of care and patient safety in Athens. That's one step that needs to be followed by many more. Let me list three pathways to take us forward. First, we need to up our investments in health systems. More is needed in terms of defining and implementing standards and established guidelines, infrastructure, laboratory capacity, tools for identifying and reducing sepsis incidence, morbidity and mortality. Second, we need to implement preventive measures against infections, such as good hygiene practices, vaccination programs and sanitation. Early diagnosis and proper clinical management are critical to improve outcomes and reduce deaths. Even though sepsis onset can be acute and poses a shorter mortality burden, it can also be the cause of significant long-term morbidity. That is why sepsis requires a multidisciplinary approach and a prepared workforce. For that to happen, we need to invest in the education and professional development of all health workers. Finally, your vision resonates and aligns with ours, the WHO's European program of work and the objective of leaving no one behind. Our program of work provides our 53 member states with the opportunity to work with stakeholders like the European Sepsis Alliance to place sepsis among public health priorities of European countries. WHO's European Programme of Work is a platform for that. We know what is needed. Let's make it happen. Let's act now, engage and collaborate to decisively prevent and treat sepsis in the WHO European region. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kluge. Um, I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Gabriela Koce, who is from the Permanent 
uh, representation of Slovenia uh, to the EU. She is the Councillor of Public Health, uh, Pharmaceuticals and Medical uh, devi Devices. Slovenia holds right now the uh, European Council presidency until December. And obviously they have been called to lead a uh, European agenda in these very challenging times. We um, know that uh, this is an intense week uh, as the European institution um, are negotiating on, on some very important issues. So therefore we are very grateful that you, Gabriella, have find time to, to, to join us today. And since I know that you will have to, to uh, run after your talk here today, I will give you some questions right away. And uh, if you can, uh, feel free to, to answer them uh, during your talk. So as a small country, would you uh, would Slovenia be uh, supportive of an uh, increased sharing of uh, resources uh, within the EU in the health area? And do you sense an increased um, appetite, so to speak, amongst member states uh, to more responsibilities to the European uh, Commission on healthcare related matters? And also uh, from the management of the pandemic on this pandemic, uh, what are the lessons learned? By Slovenia and what are the next steps Slovenia might be taking to strengthen your national uh, healthcare system? Over to uh, you, Gabriela. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and first of all, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for offering us this opportunity to discuss and learn and actually share approaches of enhancing the preparedness and uh, resilience of our health systems. Uh, so firstly, because implementation of innovative solutions for resilient health systems is the key priority topic of Slovenian presidency in the field of health, and secondly, because sepsis is one of the key issues in intensive care units also during COVID-19. Another major challenge is the treat in the treatment of sepsis is the growing threat of AMR, antimicrobial resistance. As more pathogens become resistant to available antibiotics, more people are at risk for developing sepsis, and there are less opportunities for successful treatment. One of the key priorities of Slovenian presidency is also to find ways to improve accessibility and availability of antimicrobials and repurposed medicine in treatment of unmet medical needs, where lack of commercial interest is a hindering factor. Success of the fight against antimicrobial resistance relies heavily on the commitment and willingness of governments to take actions to ensure the implementation of the initiatives under one health approach, including all relevant sectors, of course. Uh, battling the COVID pandemic continues to be one of the key priorities all around the world, which has moved health up on the agenda in the context of geopolitics, security, and economic policy. This health crisis has shown the lessons to be learned in order to be better prepared to address the current challenge, as well as similar ones in the future. Among the many lessons is that the EU and member states have to better coordinate preparedness and response mechanisms when faced with health emergencies as part of a wider effort to work together toward building a strong and resilient U European health union. Under the enormous pressure of the current COVID pandemic, European health system have, have demonstrated their capacity to innovate and adapt when need and when resources are available. For example, the use of telemedicine accelerated significantly during the pandemic, demonstrating that previously uh, all obstacles can be, or some obstacles can be indeed overcome. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, most sepsis deaths are preventable. So to stop preventable deaths from sepsis, we must all understand what sepsis is, how to recognize risk factors, and work together to bring awareness to this health threat so that it can be treated in time. 
To do that, it is very important to implement innovative solutions in health systems. So we will be better prepared to prevent such cases. So the European Commission, DG Sante, EU member states and citizens has a, have a strong commitment to protecting health and supporting strengthening health systems. Indeed, strengthening health system in face of epidemic and other long-term challenges, like also sepsis is, is one of the central aims of the EU health program and European health union package. The EU has a wide range of tools and mechanisms for developing and implementing health systems innovations and to support mutual member states learning about what works and what doesn't work. These, for example, include uh, already existing program, programs at the EU level, like EU for Health, European Social Fund Plus, um, Horizon Europe, Union Civil Protection Mechanism, Rescue, and so on. Um, these, the, those programs uh, offer real added value at the EU level. Slovenia recognizes the untaped potential for more effective use of existing EU resources and seek to improve their use to support health system resilience and to maximize health system strengthening. It also seeks to make the tools and mechanisms to help member states easier to understand to advise on which inst instruments to use at each stage of development and to better integrate be uh, different mechanisms. The ultimate aim is to help member states adapt innovations to the local situation and provide more clarity on the relevant EU financial mechanism. This would support the process of local change and speed the take up of innovations in practice and foster more resilient health system across the EU. Uh, so continuous and coordinated strategic investments in health systems and collaboration in finding innovative solutions will strengthen resilience and optimize healthcare in the future. Uh, finally, yet it's very importantly, uh, Slovenian presidency aim is also to highlight global aspect in the uh, area of strengthening health systems. COVID-19 has demonstrated the importance of global cooperation and solidarity during common health threats. It is important to bear in mind that no country is safe until everyone is safe and dealing with current global pandemic as well as with the future health threats calls for holistic, inclusive, and well-coordinated approach uh, at the EU as well as the global level. Uh, last but not the least, I would just like to go briefly through the, our priorities uh, of the Slovenian presidency. As I already mentioned, one, uh, uh, the first and uh, the most important priority is innovative approaches within uh, 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 more resilient uh, health systems. Um, I mean, uh, innovative ap approaches in order to, to, um, uh, to aiming uh, uh, strengthen and uh, more resilient health systems. And then uh, the second top priority is actually implementation of the pharmaceutical strategy as well as the cancer strategy, it's so-called cancer beating action plan. So among pharmaceutical strategy, we have uh, the we have specified uh, the priority drug shortages. Um, and then uh, if I go further to the legislative proposal, uh, we are negotiating the trio, so-called trio package uh, of EU Health Union. That means uh, legislative proposal on EMA, European Medicines Agency, legislative proposal on ECDC, this is European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, uh, and health threats regulation. Uh, so um, I have to say that uh, Slovenia has achieved 
at the end of July a great success in adopting uh, and reaching a compromise in two legislative proposals on ECDC and health threats. Uh, especially ECDC will help, will lead or aim to better data collection and knowledge sharing. Uh, so actually, this will be a great support and added value in uh, 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 better tackling uh, uh, preparedness uh, for future crisis. Uh, so uh, the last uh, legislative proposal within this trio package is EMA legislation. This can be this the this one has been adopted already under Portuguese presidency in June. Uh, so I'm happy to to tell you that uh, we have just started uh, EMA negotiations in the parliament on the 2nd of September, and uh, we are about to start uh, negotiations for the other two files, ECDC and health threats at the end of September. So we are sincerely hoping to finalize and to get an agreement and uh, compromise with the parliament uh, by the end of the year. So uh, now it's extremely important time. We have to uh, catch the momentum and uh, try to find uh, as as better solution, as better compromise as possible. So as another key priority of our presidency, I would like to expose also HERA proposal. Uh, and HERA proposal will be tabled on 14th of September. And uh, the discussion with the within the council will start already on 28th of September. So HERA proposal also means better preparedness for the future crisis, better uh, uh, response uh, to that. So HERA proposal is uh, the last of these, let's say, four legislative proposals uh, of EU Health Union, which will mean the step further in creating a safer and more resilient European Union for every one of us. So thank you for your attention and I wish you a fruitful discussion in the coming panels. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gabriela. Um, there is a question, I don't know if you have, uh, there's from an audience here uh, asking a, a quick question. Uh, can the European Commission have any impact on the Belgium government in Brussels to support current actions in the federal parliament to develop a national sepsis plan? Uh, Do you have anything to say about that? I'm not really. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, this will be very, it's very specific. Uh, this Belgium I know, should yeah. answer, you know. Yeah, it's a very know. specific uh, technical question also. Yeah. And it's uh, actually, uh, this is uh, this is uh, completely Belgium, you know, competent. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I would, uh, if they if they need, if I could check also with Belgian colleagues, you know, I would, I would be happy to check with them. And if you mail me, I can uh, give an answer, you know. Later Great. On. Well, I know that you are uh, in a hurry, so we'll we'll uh, leave you now, Gabriela. Thank you so much for taking your time to to uh, to look into our little uh, event today and and give us this really interesting points from your from your um, from your point of view. Thank you so much, yeah. Gabriela. Thanks to you and good luck at the panel and then at you. the conference. Bye bye, Simone. Thank you very much. Bye again. bye. bye. <laughs> now, um, so let's continue to our first uh, panel discussion. Uh, the topic for this discussion is how uh, the fight against sepsis can help respond to the pandemic and the global health threats. So I would like to introduce our panel moderator, Evangelos. Uh, are you there, Evangelos? Uh, maybe. Uh, Hello. There you are. Hello. Uh, Evangelos is our, the chairman of the ESA. Uh, you're very welcome. And I think I will leave the further introduction of the uh, panelists in this discussion to you, Evangelos. So over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to thank you for having the opportunity to uh, address all these uh, main uh, the important topics. Uh, and uh, I believe that first I need to uh, introduce uh, those who are with us uh, today. And uh, I see and I warmly uh, would like to introduce Maurizio Ciacconi, Professor Gilalia Nane, uh, Dr. John Ryan, and also I see that Dr. Laura Sigaloch is with us. And uh, we uh, are looking forward to a very fruitful uh, discussion 
which the idea is we want to present how the interaction between sepsis knowledge that has been developed uh, by scientists in the field the last uh, years has influenced COVID-19 and how this interaction can prime the overall knowledge at the European level of sepsis and uh, also uh, how can we enter into a fruitful collaboration with the European Commission to achieve this goal. Uh, with this in mind, I would like to address before starting that, that uh, for us who are uh, active in the field of uh, sepsis and of critical care medicine, uh, the last years, uh, when it's already 20 months since we are globally suffering from this pandemic. And uh, actually together with uh, the chairmanship of the Global Sepsis Alliance, uh, we did a meta-analysis. And in this meta-analysis, uh, we introduced all the information uh, that uh, has been published until March 2021. And we collected data if patients with COVID-19 are sufferers or not of sepsis. In other terms, if COVID-19 is a situation of viral sepsis, and we ended up with the result that almost 90% of patients with severe COVID-19, they are meeting the sepsis criteria. So in other terms, we do fully believe that our European Sepsis Alliance now at the stage of the pandemic can provide and help patients more than ever. And we believe that we need in this goal to be encouraged and receive help and assistance by the European authorities. With this in mind, uh, I would like to uh, start uh, and uh, address some questions and I would like to have the feedback by, doc by Professor Anane, by uh, Professor Ciccone and also by Laura about what is their opinion of, if they agree with me that COVID-19 is a cause of sepsis? And uh, Professor Anani. Good afternoon, Evangelis, and good, after good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to join this, uh, this session and to share ideas. So to get to your question, well, let's remember when SARS-CoV-2 hit the first people in December 99, the common thought was that it would be nothing but a common respiratory viral infection. However, we now all have realized that it has spread as a pandemic. And then the global efforts, and in particular in the research area, has yielded very valuable information, robust scientific information, from which one can take a simple message. Research inform the general public that actually what matters or the driving force toward COVID-19, that is towards getting sick from the virus, is more related to a deregulation of the host response to the virus than to the virus itself. Well, this is exactly the common definition for sepsis. So researchers during the COVID-19 have clearly established, in my opinion, that when the severe form of COVID-19 are indeed related to a deregulation of the host response to the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, resulting in complications beyond the lung and the respiratory function involving other organs and resulting in major sequels and death. And because of that understanding, then, drugs that were investigated or routinely used 
in the management of patients with sepsis when were then considered for the management of severe COVID-19. And so rapidly, clinical trials in COVID-19 patients have investigated a number of that drugs. And only one, maybe the most spectacular example, are corticosteroids. If one can remind the initial recommendation from WHO and the scientific com community in January or February 2020 was against the use of corticosteroids because the common thought was that it was going to be a classical respiratory virus uh, infection and people will be harmed by corticosteroids. And now, after the improved knowledge in the mechanism of the disease and the clinical investigation of the benefit and harm of corticosteroids, it's clearly established that that drug routinely used in sepsis in general has proven to save lives in patients with COVID-19, further arguing that COVID-19 and sepsis belongs to the same entity. Other immunomodulatory treatments and other treatments like, for example, anticoagulation, have shown promising effects in studies on COVID-19. And then, by turn, I think strongly that this experience coming from COVID-19 should serve more broadly sepsis management. And these drugs needs likely now to be investigated in clinical trials for sepsis more broadly beyond COVID-19. So the global effort to fight COVID, in my view, need to be continued to fight sepsis more broadly and in three main areas in particular. First one, the synergistic involvement of experts in multiple areas of life science, not only of medical science, was of the utmost importance in the improved knowledge for COVID-19. And that effort should be continued to improve the knowledge in sepsis more broadly. Second, the fantastic financial, both public and private financial investment to fight against COVID-19 should be continued to fight against more broadly sepsis. And finally, a third, the novel approaches that has emerged in particular in acute medicine uh, during the COVID pandemic, and I'm, I'm particularly referring to platform trials that has proved to be very efficient tool to rapidly get a valuable data to inform clinical practices, these tools need to be continued to fight more broadly against sepsis and therefore need to be supported in particular at the level of the European Commission. And from that suggestion, uh, I will pass uh, the microphone to uh, my colleagues. Well, I would like to listen also to uh, Maurizio Ciacconi. Yes, can, can you hear me? Very well, yes, please. Very good, so um, I think Gilali has already answered, but the, if I have to cut a long story short, I would say that uh, you know, the new definitions of sepsis talk about development of organ dysfunction in, uh, you know, in response to an infection. So I think, yes, COVID-19, when it leads to organ dysfunction and all those patients that reach the uh, hospital admissions, they basically, they, they are part of the family of sepsis. Uh, what has been very different for us this time compared to what was happening in the past is that usually for us, sepsis is a term that uh, brings together syndromes and uh, syndrome for many causes. While this time there was a single cause, which was uh, uh, this virus. But it's very important indeed that we do not forget that is sepsis. Um, especially because uh, COVID-19 hopefully at some point will go away 
but sepsis unfortunately is here to stay. Is here to stay and uh, all the issues that we've seen around the COVID-19 uh, in terms of organ dysfunction, the need for organ support, and um, very importantly also how patients will recover after an ICU stay after COVID-19, uh, which is very commonly referred as long COVID, um, in the reality, we knew that from previous infections and severe sepsis and septic shock in the intensive care uh, that can lead to post-ICU syndromes. So patients take a long time to recover. Uh, we've studied that many of these patients, they find it very difficult to return to work, to a productive life. So it's a major issue. So uh, I really think that it's important that uh, the legacy of this pandemic will also mean uh, be better prepared to cope uh, with, uh, with sepsis. Um, we've seen it with COVID that the early identification of these patients and an early start of organ support is important for their recovery. That's why our intensive care units are being uh, under uh, such a stress, uh, because exactly what we wanted to do was to provide timely intervention, timely ICU beds to every patient that would benefit from an ICU bed. And, uh, and that meant uh, uh, stretching our human resources, having um, uh, healthcare workers not working regularly in intensive care, coming to work to our intensive care unit. I am the president of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. And I really think that if we want to treat better sepsis in the future, we need to invest not just in technology and bed spaces, uh, but also on, uh, on education and training and to have a more flexible workforce to be able to absorb uh, what will be maybe not necessarily a pandemic like this one, but there will be other crises with uh, bacteria, with other viruses that will bring stress to our system. Uh, to conclude, COVID-19 has also shown the problem sometimes of multi-resistant uh, bacterial infections, so sepsis complicating uh, other uh, causes of sepsis, so sepsis that comes on top of COVID-19. And again, that's a major issue that we don't have to forget, also for the antimicrobial resistance uh, and so on. Um, I'm just going to conclude also by sharing some positive, however, on this. Um, the fact that we've seen with the European Commission, for instance, the fact that there was a lot of attention, not just on technology, but also on human resources. And indeed, the European Commission funded a training program, uh, which we as European Society of Intensive Care Medicine organized and delivered, which is called c in Space, and uh, managed to train more than 17,000 healthcare workers not working regularly in intensive care in Europe to help ICU teams. I think all these experiences are showing how much we need to invest in intensive care in the future to, to carry on looking after patients with sepsis. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, so, uh, do you uh, is there any comment on uh, this uh, specific uh, technical medical questions coming from uh, Laura Sigalot? Or from, uh, and I think also that Julio is with us. I apologize that it seems that I, my connection is not the best one. Uh, yes, Julio, yes, please. I am Angelos, and I, to everybody, thank you for organizing this and uh, carry on this important debate regarding, uh, uh, regarding sepsis and how it is connected with COVID. I am following this huge effort also with the European Sepsis Alliance uh, from our, an organizational point of view, uh, taking care of quality improvement and patient safety in Italy, especially in Tuscany region. And during this year, I'm involved in the Global Sepsis Alliance since the beginning. I had the opportunity to interact with lots of professionals and especially with Gianpaolo Monti from CRT, who uh, was supposed to present, but uh, I'm substituting her and apologize. Uh, but I'm going to, if it's time to do, do it now. I'm going to share some slides. Uh, am I allowed to do that or it is now? Uh, please do that and uh, please do that. And also I would like to uh, inform all of us who are listening to us that uh, Giulio Tocafondi is responsible about the 
insurance in the region of Tuscany in uh, Italy. It's uh, for us uh, great that uh, he managed to find time and join us. And thank you really very much. I most appreciate your being with us. Please share your screen. Can you see? Uh, yeah, can you see the screen? Yeah, I've got the feedback now on my video as well. Thank you, Evangelos. I'm part of the Clinical Risk Management Center and Patient Safety Center of Tuscany Region. And Gian Paolo Monti, she's delegate of CRT in uh, Global Sepsi Alliance and European Sepsi Alliance. And she's also a uh, brilliant intensivist care in, uh, in Guarda, Milano. What I'm showing now is the actor taking part in the tackling sepsis effort in Italy. We have now showcasing two examples of the two Italian uh, federal healthcare system who started uh, uh, probably as a primary effort, uh, the tackling of sepsis, which is regional Lombardy and following region Toscana. And on the other side of the screen, you can see Agenas, which is the national agency for healthcare services that she is, is now leading an important uh, project to which we are contributing regarding the monitoring of sepsis and, of course, the CRT, Scientific Society of Intensive Care uh, in Italy. Let me start with what uh, Regione Lombardia has been up to since 2013. Uh, Regione Lombardia was the first to formally uh, acknowledge the challenge of sepsis as a complex healthcare system. Uh, they develop an important decree. Uh, this decree laid the groundwork for a series of intervention. They define the targets, the intervention tools, methods, and endpoints. They really brought uh, an impressive, uh, uh, an impressive research and training work to all the hospitals in, uh, in Lombardia, and now they are really collecting the work, uh, the results of this impressive work. In fact, what they did was something really uh, interesting, and they started to systematically use the uh, current data from uh, um, discharge reports in order to have a monitoring of the, um, of the, of the sepsis cases. This is also the strategy that was uh, used also in the global burden of sepsis. It is mainly based on ICD uh, reports code. And it, it is used to then um, uh, instruct a specific audit regarding the specific uh, criticalities that you will uh, you, that you can find in the in the in the clinical pathway, and of course they also developed some really impressive uh, stuff on the sepsis management in the terms of uh, maternal care. As you can see, the uh, effort of uh, Tuscany region started a little bit later, but we really followed the, 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 the path of uh, Lombardy region. We constantly work together in sharing experiences and inputs. What we did in 2019 was this important framework document, which is available also in English, which is called Fight Against, Fight Against Sepsis, Call to Action. Is, the, is a framework that we develop uh, within a multidisciplinary team that was coordinated by me as a um, patient safety and uh, human factor expert because it was needed a really third eye view able to integrate the different uh, uh, professionals and the, the different point of view. We came up with this document that is now used in Toscany as the main framework for developing hospital guidelines regarding the management of sepsis. In particular, we introduced some important key process indicator regarding how ambulances and emergency department care is uh, able to handle sepsis. And also we introduced a six plus one uh, way of uh, monitoring sepsis. Six plus one means the sepsis six plus one. Plus one is the source control, timely source control involved in the surgical department. Uh, we are also paying lots of attention to the role of the microbiology uh, network in order to provide, to provide timely response to the need of uh, moving as soon as possible from an empirical therapy to a targeted uh, micro, antimicrobial therapy. And also we are now monitoring uh, the, as a research point of view, the host response. So not only focusing on the anti antibiotic therapy, but also the response from, from the host. And in parallel, we are carrying on the same effort that is being carried out in Lombardy. There is the administrative, uh, that is the extraction of administrative data 
in order to identify criticalities in the coding of sepsis and in the frequency of sepsis cases. We know that it's not something epidemiologically uh, strong enough. In fact, we are using that as a proxy to later on uh, uh, start more uh, specific uh, audit and observation in the local context. In parallel, we are carrying on the, the maintenance of patient safety practice regarding the implementation of rapid response team and pediatric and neonatal management of sepsis. These two experiences of Regione Lombardia and Regione Toscana uh, fostered an, in, an interesting project of the EDGE Agenas, that is the um, National Agency for Research Activity, in charge also for technical report regarding the Patient Safety uh, Committee. So this uh, agency as a national, uh, national, uh, national arena, in fact, uh, 11 uh, federal healthcare system are joining this project. And this project is basically the, what we have been done in Lombardy and Tuscany, implemented to the whole, uh, to the whole uh, nation. That is, using uh, the specific algorithm to track abnormal, abnormal ab ab criticalities and abnormalities in the coding of sepsis, as is using current and administrative data. And then, based on that, uh, uh, activate some specific uh, auditing process uh, using the clinical risk management and patient safety network in Italy that is quite well uh, developed. It, it is a um, current research activity project that will uh, uh, going on also after 2022. Uh, in parallel, we are really uh, supported by the action carried out by CIATI, which is really uh, uh, having a pivotal role also with the uh, Ministry uh, uh, of Health in terms of proposing uh, um, clinical guidelines. In Italy, since 2017, uh, uh, we need to have really well-defined uh, um, uh, clinical guidelines. These clinical gui guidelines are used also in terms of patient safety and uh, um, checking uh, the, 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 the default uh, of the system in terms of, also of uh, um, claims and uh, um, insurance uh, um, frailties. But it's basically an important step that was achieved also in cooperation with the Emergency Medicine um, Society. Uh, of course, CRT is developing a, a really good uh, research, especially at the European level in cooperation with the European Society and also on the national level, especially with GVT. GVT is, is, a, is a network of, um, of researchers, uh, of intensivists intensivist, uh, collecting data. These data, for example, have been used uh, for the definition of the sepsis tree uh, um, study. So they really uh, provided a huge amount of data to the, uh, to the definition, to the new definition of sepsis that was used for the new definition of sepsis. And so this is my last slide, accounting uh, for what has been done by Tuscany, Lombardy, and CRT since 2012 in terms of rising awareness. We are now launching the 10th Sepsis Day uh, next, uh, uh, the next um, uh, Tuesday. And also CRT and Lombardy region, they are both active in uh, raising awareness, uh, uh, running uh, impressive uh, communication with the media, especially with newspapers, and also uh, raising awareness, uh, having uh, organizing every every year really really important uh, really important happenings open to the general public. So it was really interesting to share uh, to listen to you and share with uh, my thoughts and our work with you i'm really uh, uh, waiting for comments and questions and i will stay tuned of course thank you for your attention now so i would like to thank you very much and all i uh, realize is that uh, uh, there is a big feeling that everybody accepts that the pandemia that we are uh, getting through has the characteristics of what has been, uh, we know about bacterial sepsis and that much of the knowledge that has been uh, and the criteria that we have developed so far for applies that. I'm particularly grateful to uh, uh, Dr. Ciccone, who's leading the 
a European Society of Intensive Care Medicine uh, telling that, and I'm also grateful to Professor Gilali Anane about uh, adding on this. And also I would like to thank you very much for all the great presentation of uh, what is happening in Tuscany all uh, the uh, rest, uh, all these years. However, I would like to try to elaborate now more on the interrelation about between sepsis and uh, COVID-19. And the question is, one of the major hurdles that we have faced so far is the overall lack of awareness about what sepsis is. However, for COVID-19, there is global awareness. Why? Because it is a pandemic and it's a major hurdle. The question, however, is, can all of us inform people that the reason why so fast, because if you can imagine that the pandemia started end of February arrived in Europe last year, and all of a sudden we managed to provide care to our patients, we managed to provide treatment to our patients. How much is this related to all this background work that all of us have done for almost 20 years now? Because honestly, I feel that if you have come across a patient that ill as a patient with COVID-19, if there is no background preparation in terms of background knowledge that has been acquired over many years, it would have been impossible to help, to help these patients. So I would like to go now to a diff with a different series, uh, all three of you, uh, these uh, questions. And I would like first to ask uh, President Ciccone about how he feels about it. Does indeed the early initiation of management protocols, the as Professor Arane said, all the know-how about how to do trials, the networks, research networks that have been built between us all these years, was COVID-19 a time point where all these became apparent? And is it high time that we make a worthy world about that? Can I start? Yes, please. So I, I, I think uh, Evangelos, the, I think the, yes, the answer is, is already in, in the question in a sense, and I think you're absolutely right that we need to increase the awareness on this. With the Global Sepsis Alliance, with the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine and the Society of Critical Care Medicine, uh, recently we published a, a, a kind of a manifest on this, exactly to talk about what will be the legacy of COVID-19 for what concerns sepsis. And uh, the main points of that are exactly what you say, the fact that we need to recognize the sepsis like cancer, um, it's an umbrella describing, you know, a, a syndrome which is very heterogeneous, but and under which really there are a series of causes, and we don't have to have a tunnel vision about these causes because sometimes I have the feeling that COVID-19 brought us a little bit to a tunnel vision, in the sense that we report uh, asymptomatic cases, we report how the pandemic is going, and that's very important. Uh, but when it comes to patients with sepsis in intensive care, there are many more causes of uh, sepsis for uh, coming to an intensive care. And the reality, we have not done that mapping exercise very well in Europe. Uh, there are some mapping exercises that have done in individual countries. But if we want to know what is the global burden of sepsis in intensive care units in Europe, for instance, that's something that we try sometimes systematically to do with point prevalence studies and so on, but there is not really a formal registry at European level to look at that. And I think something like COVID should prompt us to look at uh, severe infections leading to intensive care admissions in this sense. It's also very important to increase the awareness of sepsis in, uh, with lay people, with the community, with, uh, you know, events like these are extremely important. Um, you know, we can save lives by promoting vaccinations, not just for uh, COVID-19, but by promoting vaccinations for pneumococcal, by promoting vaccinations for many diseases that are preventable. And we know that the uptake of those diseases are not perfect, of those vaccinations are not perfect at the moment. 
And at the same time, like this was done for stroke or for myocardial infarctions, um, diseases that I would like to remind everyone are very well known by the public, but they carry on a much lower mortality compared to sepsis. And we are not even, uh, we've not even been able to tell uh, people that this could be sign of sepsis, you know, confusion, being short of breath. Um, we don't, uh, you don't hear about this with the community normally. I think it requires everyone to feel about the fact that, uh, uh, you know, that sepsis is out there and is something very important. Um, there is a lot of uh, misinformation and bad communication around this sometimes. If you talk about a stroke or a myocardial infarction, everyone understands that something that can happen to anyone. If you talk about an infection, there is sometimes almost a stigma to talk about an infection. While actually infections and severe infections can happen to anyone, we can prevent them and we can help really to recognize them early and to treat them early. And so this is a battle like for COVID-19 that we can win together also by and only by raising uh, the awareness together with institutions today, I see, I'm very pleased to see the European Commission with uh, a very good uh, relationship in the last 12 months working together. And uh, we, as the intensive care community, we always say we are the last line of defense. We can show what happened to people when everything else fails, but I really think the public health uh, about preventing sepsis, about recognizing sepsis and about treating sepsis early are really where we have to put uh, our biggest efforts at the moment, and of course also by uh, providing research funding around sepsis, not just on treatments, treatments are important, uh, but really we need to understand now what is the infrastructure to support sepsis in, even in different countries, what is the availability of acute care beds, of ICU beds uh, for this, and uh, what are the causes of sepsis different times of the year, different countries. We talked before about antimicrobial resistance, very important to tackle. If we don't sort it out, even if we recognize sepsis, we may not have at some point the right tools to fight it. And so this, uh, this legacy that COVID-19 is leaving to us is something that we need to embrace and to, and to really to work with all the policymakers to, to make sure that even when COVID-19 is gone, we don't forget that there are many other infections that can lead to severe illness and intensive care admissions. You're on mute, I think. Before going to John Ryan, I would like that we uh, conclude uh, the way uh, all of us who are the active physicians in the uh, research field are thinking. So I would like the comment of Professor Anani on that. And then I would like from John Ryan to comment. Uh, it is obvious that uh, all that has been used to save people from during the pandemia was built from the sepsis field. So I want your comment on that. But before that, I would love to uh, welcome for a very short comment, Professor Anana, and then uh, you need yeah. to comment on this big question. <laughs> yeah, so very briefly, I, I, my thought is that the pandemic has brought as taken out of the dark intensive care medicine because of the issue of bed capacity and so on. But unfortunately, it has not taken out of the dark sepsis because we missed the opportunity to communicate what at the scientific level we know, the link between COVID-19 and sepsis. And so we failed in my view, to communicate this toward lay public and toward more and toward politicians, because the the issue to take sepsis out of the dark for me is beforehand a political issue. In France, we uh, got uh, a success in convincing the minister of health that sepsis should be taken out of the dark, and France has reached. A concrete achievements in, in, in bringing the for one only example is for since starting in 2022, France will report annually for France the burden for sepsis, just like France is reporting annually the report for perinatal, 
perinatal mortality, for uh, pregnancy mortality, for uh, cancer, and so on. So now sepsis will be uh, reported. And because the politicians in France has taken the messages of the importance to invest on, on sepsis. Uh, so I think the, my, main, uh, my, my, my main take home message here is if we could get at the European level, the European Commission and Parliament really endorsing sepsis as the best way to prepare the world for the next pandemic is by optimizing sepsis right now. Everything we will do for sepsis right now will be very helpful for the next pandemic, whatever would be the next pandemic. So now we want to start our debate. And before that, we want to have the opinion from the European Commission. So John Ryan, thank you very much for joining us. It's a big honor for us and pleasure to have you with us. No, it's a great pleasure for me to participate and to have listened to all of the presentations so far. And I'd like to thank you for the work of uh, the European Sepsis Alliance and uh, the contribution that you're making to improving standards and uh, improving best practices across Europe. So first of all, my great uh, recognition of your work as an association and your collective knowledge and expertise, which uh, obviously um, uh, by sharing together, you can also increase and increase its impact. So uh, we know that there have already been uh, several uh, practices, best practices, medical best practices already applied in intensive care and, and have been deployed during the COVID pandemic. Uh, for example, um, strong infection prevention and control has really been the center of, of the response. And for COVID, the current epidemiological situation is characterized by a high and stable overall case notification and a low but slow, slowly increasing death rate. Uh, the variant of Delta is the uh, big uh, predominant variant at the moment. But of course, we have um, tried to increase our sequencing efforts around Europe. Uh, you've probably read that in the last few days, the CDC has signed a contract a very large scale contract to help the member states increase their sequencing capacity. So I would say at the moment, we're really trying to focus on keeping uh, infection as, as low as, as we can by encouraging countries to maintain social distancing, hand washing, face masks where, uh, where possible. We've put in place initiatives to encourage um, safe travel uh, by using the digital um, COVID pass, which includes, as you know, um, a proof of vaccination. It includes a proof of a test, test result, a negative test result, or a recovery certificate. So we really tried to um, put in place very uh, reinforced surveillance, uh, put in place uh, support to member states to keep the variants under strong um, survey and thirdly to um, uh, to uh, try and encourage the take up of vaccination. Now the vaccines as you know um, were purchased through a common uh, purchased between the 27 member states. I think that's probably worth mentioning because it's the first time it's happened. We've purchased uh, uh, products in the past together. Uh, for example, uh, the last product which we pur purchased was uh, uh, um, in relation to uh, biotoxin where the member states had a need for a rather unusual and rare uh, biotoxin. Um, in the context of the CBRN preparedness, so a security threat, in other words. We did try and purchase uh, pandemic flu vaccines in the past as well. That was not successful because of difficulties around liability. So really the first successful major joint procurement, which we have managed to do together between the 27 was the COVID vaccine. And, and just to say that this is... Um, 
it has provided a supply of COVID vaccines, different COVID vaccines to all EU member states exactly when they were needed. So having negotiated together, we obtained the first supply as soon as they left the factories, they were delivered uh, to the member states and the member states were able to, to vaccinate their population. So I, I don't think we can underestimate the impact that that's had because I have a member of my family living in New Zealand and I can tell you it's certainly not the case in New Zealand, it's not the case in other parts of the world where this effort to develop and procure vaccines was not achieved with the same level of speed. We're continuing to procure vaccines at the moment um, because uh, we anticipate that there will be a need um, for continued uh, availability of vaccines in the autumn and maybe next year um, in respect of um, booster doses for certain types of population um, and also for the people who are not yet fully vaccinated. For example, there are two member states where the uh, vaccination rates are less than 20%, even if the majority, are, uh, even if we have 70% uh, reached uh, for, the, for the average of EU member states, there are still member states which are below, um, below far below the target. And, and therefore, uh, we're really pushing this, um, this effort to improve surveillance, to improve the surveillance of variants, to make sure that vaccines are rolled out and made available to the population. And uh, by the way, you may also be interested, given your professional backgrounds, uh, to the fact that we have a therapy strategy, a therapy strategy which has the aim to develop 10, 10 new therapies for COVID before the end of the year. And just to let you know that this is a work in progress, but the European Medicines Agency is currently uh, carrying out a rolling review on clinical trials, which are ongoing for um, COVID therapies. So not only focusing on, on vaccination, but also including elements around uh, development of, um, of, uh, of therapies. Now, um, our colleague from the uh, council presidency was speaking earlier on, and she referred to the need to reinforce our European frameworks and legislation. I'd like to say a word on that if you don't mind. Uh, first of all, uh, the Commission has proposed what we call a health union package. And the health union package is an effort to identify the elements regarding cross-border threats, which need to be strengthened on the basis of what we think are the lessons that have been learned from the COVID pandemic so far. So you were asking several speakers about you know, what are the, um, the lessons learned so far? We try to really learn lessons as quickly as possible. And one of the lessons we've learned is the need for quicker and more reliable data from member states. So we are proposing a new legal text, which would be legally binding on the member states and which would oblige member states to step up their efforts for reporting of communicable diseases and health threats. Uh, that's the first point. The second point is we would be hoping to improve the, um, the risk assessment, which is done by the ECDC, and you'll be hearing from Dominique Monet later on in the session. Um, the idea there is that they should not in the future focus only on the analysis which they do at the moment and which you can read online on their website, uh, it's really um, an analysis carried out from the perspective of the ECDC. The idea in the future is that we would try and take on board other angles, for example, the angle relating to the availability of treatments. So we would encourage our agents, <coughs> we would encourage our agencies to work uh, also together with, for example, the medicines agency or other agencies who might be concerned with the supply of pharmaceutical products in order that we have a more rounded, inclusive risk assessment in order to prepare more effective countermeasures. 
And the third aspect of the proposal is to include, um, to, to have the possibility to um, make recommendations in a more convincing way to the member states, because at the moment, the member states sit around in the Health Security Committee and they discuss what's going on, but there's no real uh, power of decision or um, adoption of common measures. It's very difficult with the way the treaty is written uh, to have a adoption of a common measure. And, and therefore, you know, there's a huge difference there, by the way, between animal health and human health. We're living through the African swine fever uh, at the moment. And I can tell you, my veterinary colleagues uh, working in the same department here, they have full powers in relation to, uh, to uh, African swine fever. Uh, I, I wish I had 1% of the powers which they have, because really um, it's uh, totally in the hands of the member states how they react to these cross-border threats. And therefore, we're proposing to stretch our legal powers as far as they can go within the context of the of the existing treaty. So this health union package, which the council presidency referred to, is something we're working on with the European Council and with the partners in the European Parliament at the moment. <clears throat> and I think that this will give Europe the tools to improve its performance in relation to future threats. Uh, I'd just like to say a few words, Vangelos, if I might, concerning the financial instruments, because I think it's one thing to have legislation, it's another thing if we have some financial firepower as well. And there we actually, there was a lucky coincidence, you know, when, when two stars come together in the sky, uh, it's an unusual uh, happening. And this actually happened early on in the pandemic, where we realized that we, we had an opportunity to make a proposal to strengthen our legislation, as I've described. But we had an opportunity as well to uh, shape the, the budget. Now, Europe has a seven-year budget. You know, you have a one-year budget in Italy, you have a one-year budget in Greece, you have a one-year budget in Ireland. But in Europe, we have the benefit of having a seven-year perspective. And therefore, we were able to shape the budget to match the legal proposal which we were making. This is very important. So at the moment, it, for example, uh, a previous speaker was referring to the cancer plan, which is one of the Europe, uh, beating, Europe beating cancer plan. It's one of our big um, flagship initiatives in public health. We are now publishing calls for proposals in relation to cancer based on this policy initiative. So there's a linkage between the policy initiative, the cancer plan and the financial instruments. Uh, we're, we're also in a few in the next few weeks we'll be launching a cancer mission under the horizon europe research program so you can see we're trying to match the legal ambitions with the or the policy ambitions with the financial instruments and that brings me to another point which is the hera which was referred to as well by my colleague from the council now this is an idea which you may be familiar with you may not be familiar with Following 9-11 in the United States, they realized that most of the manufacture of essential pharmaceutical products was taking place outside the United States. And they thought that this was a security risk. So they created what they call the BARDA, which is an agency of the United States government to identify threats to develop the medical products to deal with those threats, and then to purchase the and stockpile the products. Now, for many years, Europe had nothing similar. And indeed, most member states had nothing similar. And we have now uh, proposed the idea that there should be a European mechanism to identify future threats uh, to research and develop products to deal with those threats. And thirdly, to purchase and negotiate the manufacture and stockpiling of the products. And antimicrobial resistance and antibiotics are one of the 
areas that will be covered by this approach. You will be seeing next week the proposals from the Commission to create this mechanism. So next week, uh, I'll be able to tell you a lot more than I'm able to tell you today. But believe me that uh, maybe even a, a specific briefing for your members on that point might be of interest to you because it's really linked closely to the issue of AMR and infection control as well. So you can see that COVID has in fact stirred up a lot of activity at the European Union level. I hope that that activity will translate into a reinforcement of your resources at the national level and that the political ambition that we have to protect Europe and to protect Europe's citizens will translate into a real um, change and resource change at the national level as well. Thank you very much. I do thank you very much. And uh, uh, I would like that uh, uh, all these uh, considerations, uh, particularly also as how much financing on the new steps will be, we have uh, about uh, five to 10 minutes to end. I would like uh, some concluding remarks from uh, one minute, if possible, each of uh, Dr. Ciacconi, Professor Anane, and uh, Dr. Tocafondi. Dr. Ciacconi. Hello, everyone. Girls. I didn't understand a general remark or on a, a general point. remark, and actually as a, a type of answer to uh, the positioning uh, set by John Ryan. Nadi, I, I think the what was just said. I think it's a. Uh, it's very important. I mean, I, I often finish end my presentations about uh, my experience with COVID-19 on the fact that we cannot be unprepared twice. And actually, we have demonstrated, unfortunately, the different ways that we managed to be unprepared more than once. Um, it would be, I think it would be not acceptable. I don't, not would be. It's not acceptable that we leave a legacy of not being prepared to the next generations. I mean, we don't know when the next pandemic will be, when the next healthcare threat will be, but I'm very positive because I have participated in the consultations on some papers that were referred to, like the HERA, uh, the European Health Union. I think we have a great opportunity to help each other more in Europe and to be better prepared uh, to be self-sufficient, also very important. We've seen during the initial part of the crisis how this put a significant stress on the system. We didn't talk about personal protective equipment, for instance, today of some devices, but there was also that. So my message is uh, really we cannot be unprepared twice. So we need to take this opportunity to be better prepared. And uh, as Gilali was saying before, if we prepare on sepsis, we will be better prepared for the next uh, infectious disease threat. Professor Anane? Yeah, I will conclude with a wish. A wish that the new ECDC, a wish that the uh, new development within EMEA, the, we, the wish that uh, in the Horizon 2020 calls, the term sepsis, be incorporated. Because, for example, as far as I know, if one goes through the whole calls of Horizon 2020, covering apparently whole domains in medicine, the words, the word sepsis never is mentioned. That is my wish. My wish is that the term sepsis be incorporated in major texts from the European Commission. And I think that would also have a major impact beyond Europe that would lead other parts of the world to uh, reach that level of knowledge, awareness, to tackle sepsis that is a continuing and sustained pandemic. It is an unrecognized sustained pandemic. Dr. Ciocafondi? I can only echo what's already said by Dr. Cecconi and Professor Annan. 
There is no point in developing a really resilient healthcare system if the threat of the new pandemic will come from another part of the world. We really need to uh, strengthen cooperation program in order to allow also other parts of the world to rise the level uh, in tackling uh, complex, all the complex uh, um, disease like uh, like sepsis. And uh, the effort of the European Union is, is really important, is remarkable, and uh, the surveillance of today would become the, uh, the prevention and uh, preparedness of tomorrow. So we really need to anticipate and to keep on a really high the level of surveillance to the new antimicrobial threats that could be fungi or any other viral. So we really need to, to improve our microbiological defense in, these, uh, in terms of genomic sequencing and investing on technology and artificial intelligence to coordinate better our effort. And in the end, always the humans will make the difference. So it's really important to carry on meeting like this, uh, in, in improve our uh, uh, socializ so socialization skills also in a world in which that uh, connectedness is the main, uh, one of the main opportunities. So really stay together and go on in this effort. Thank you. Well, uh, as a uh, chairman of the European Sepsis Alliance, I feel uh, extremely uh, happy and also extremely uh, privileged to chair this session uh, demonstrating the, how important it is to uh, keep the awareness of sepsis. However, uh, just because all of us we who are working as pioneers in the field for a great many years, we know the story. Uh, and I see that also uh, John Ryan has addressed some messages in the chat. Although the traditionally the, the, the chairman of a session needs to conclude the session, I would like to ask John Ryan to conclude the session by telling uh, to all of us what uh, he chat, he, the messages he sent to us and also uh, what uh, is the positioning of European Commission for us at, as a concluding uh, remark in order to help indeed future generations. You have two minutes to conclude the session. From well, my part, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for all the ideas and, and commitment that I've seen during today's session. Uh, I'd like to ensure, assure you that the European Commission is fully committed to improving public health and to avoiding uh, future pandemics. And we're really pulling out all the stops, legal and financial, in order to try and learn the lessons and make sure that we're reinforcing our position and the position of the member states, because we've seen that if you don't control an outbreak like COVID, then the whole of society can be closed down. And you just have to, I had a meeting yesterday afternoon with the airline sector, and I can tell you, if there's anyone sadder than the medical profession, it's the airline sector, because they really have had the carpet pulled out from under their feet on so many occasions. You know, they had so many hopes for uh, going back to normal, going, but I mean, the whole, of society has really been affected. So I think we have, through the COVID outbreak, really learned the lesson, and I hope our colleagues have learned the lesson that if you don't have a health system that's working, if you can't control an outbreak, then you have a major problem for business continuity and for, for society as a whole. And I, I just hope that that lesson and the lessons that we've learned from this event are, are are actually implemented and the corrections in the systems are implemented before uh, they're forgotten. Because it's not a question of the next threat coming immediately afterwards. It's more a risk, in my opinion, that the lessons that we have at the moment will be replaced by something else. So I think it's really important that we embed our knowledge and embed our experiences and embed our lessons learned uh, together and make sure that we make these improvements in the short term. There was a remark which was made earlier in respect to vaccination and the, uh, the importance Maurizio was making there the comment about vaccination. And I think there is a point I'd like to make as well about communication and literacy. There's only so much that non-specialists can understand about health topics. And I think you've really got to be careful as an association 
<clears throat> to develop good communication tools as we've been trying to do with the ECDC in respect of antimicrobial resistance. It's absolutely not obvious to the normal person in the street, what is the difference between a, a bacteria and a virus? If you haven't studied the subject, you won't know. And therefore you have to explain these things in a way that's legible to the population in different cultural settings and tell them what they need to know. We try to do that with the cancer code, you know, where we have 12 key messages for the public about reducing their cancer risk. And I think it's really important that if you are going to go forward on uh, heightening knowledge and heightening uh, sensitivity of the public uh, to the risk of, of sepsis that you actually spell that out in, in a language they can understand. And I can tell you from having worked with the EARC and the International Agency for Cancer Research, they developed the text. It's not simple, you know. You, you, you think something is, is simple because you've studied it and you're a professor and you're working on the subject every day, but really communicating with the public is a separate challenge and you really need to bring in the specialists on that and of course we would be we would be eager to help you in that work as well so again thank you very much for all your commitment and for all your ideas and we're 100 percent behind you thank you thank you thank very you. much um evangelos do you uh, have any final uh, thing to say yes, or uh, we, i believe that this concludes in a perfect way our session yep I agree. I agree. Well, thank you all for uh, participating. Um, now let's continue to uh, the, the next uh, panel uh, debate or discussion. Um, the topic for this discussion is the lack of uh, data and knowledge on sepsis and uh, uh, what are uh, the practical uh, solutions to, to tackle this deficit. Uh, so let me introduce our uh, panel moderator, uh, Laura uh, Cicolot, who is a uh, deputy coordinator of the ESA policy and stakeholder work group. And uh, Laura is also a policy officer at Health First Europe, which is a, a highly active multi-stakeholder platform headquartered in, in Belgium. Uh, Health First Europe is a non-profit, uh, non-commercial Alliance of patients and, and uh, healthcare workers, ac academics, um, healthcare experts, and, and medical technology industry. So, uh, very welcome, Laura. And I leave the further uh, introduction of the panelists uh, in this discussion to you. Thank you, uh, Madame Ulrika, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, introducing me so accurately. Um, again, I'm um, Laura Cigolotz, uh, and I'm really pleased to be here today also uh, for having been invited to moderate uh, this uh, timely and uh, important uh, panel sessions on the lack of data and uh, knowledge on sepsis. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, uh, all my colleagues at the European Sepsis uh, uh, Alliance, uh, and especially to thank uh, uh, the coordinator of the Regional Sepsis Alliances, uh, Mr. Simone Mancini, uh, for the excellent, let's say, organization, but also for the valuable collaboration of the, per, uh, of the past uh, months. I'm really honored to be here today, and I really uh, commend not only um, myself, but uh, uh, also Alfred Stewart uh, truly applauds uh, the work that uh, you are doing, and I feel uh, really um, encouraged, let's say, by today's debate, and I encourage everyone in the audience also, not only the speakers and the experts in the field of sepsis, but everyone in the audience uh, to share and really consult uh, uh, the newly released uh, uh, report um, um, released by the European Sepsis Alliance today, because uh, it uh, includes uh, a comprehensive collection of best practices in the fight against sepsis across Europe. So um, I strongly uh, invite you to uh, go over the report and to share it within your own network, uh, but also on social media channels. So without further ado, I welcome and open um, this panel and uh, I'm delighted to introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Professor Adam Linder, who is the coordinator of the European Sepsis Alliance uh, Working Group on Research. Also, a warm welcome to Dr. Dominique Monet, 
who is the head of a disease program on antimicrobial resistance and healthcare associated infections at the ECDC, the European Center um, for Disease Prevention and Control. And uh, um, also a warm welcome to um, the member of the European Parliament, Christian um, Silvio Bushoi, I hope to pronounce it well, from uh, Romania, is a member of the European um, People's Party uh, political group in the European Parliament. So I really look forward to hearing your ideas, your thoughts, uh, your presentations, and really the practical solutions that are needed now uh, not in the future, but now to um, address the lack of data and knowledge on sepsis. Um, so uh, without further ado, now I hand the floor uh, to you, Professor uh, Dr. Adam Linder, uh, for your presentation and feel free uh, to share also your screen and the slides. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Laura. And I also want to express my Gratitude to the European Sepsis Alliance for organizing this uh, fantastic event and also for inviting me to share some thoughts on the lack of data and knowledge on sepsis and some possible ways for forward. <clears throat> we all know uh, the WHO sepsis resolution from uh, 2007. 17, they highlighted uh, 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 several important points, but what they said needs to be done is to increase awareness. That's among the public, the healthcare, and the decision makers. And also get a better estimation of the sepsis in, in incidence and the quality of patient management uh, of sepsis in your, Europe. So why is this a challenge then? I'm a specialist in infectious diseases working in Sweden. It's a small con con country, uh, but what we know that the sepsis incidence in Sweden is approximately 700 per 100,000. This is based on one study, the, doc uh, the Lisa Mel Melhammer study, where we, uh, they performed a manual chart re review, not uh, re relying on I ICD codes. This is actually an incidence as large as cancer in Sweden. But still the public, only 49% of adult Sweden knows about sepsis. And also within the health healthcare personnel, there are huge national variations in how we identify sepsis and also how we treat patients and if we follow them, them, them up. And Lastly, the decision makers, they, they are actually quite unaware of the incidence, the, the true incidence of sepsis, the costs uh, of sepsis, and also that we as clinicians really lack diagnostic and th therapeutic tools. And also one thing is the association between sepsis and antimicrobial resistance is not clear to uh, the decision makers at all times. If we did not have sepsis, then antimicrobial resistance would not be a big pro pro problem because the big problem is when you get a life-threatening infection that you cannot treat. So how can we deal with, with these pro problems? And, yeah, increase awareness through national public campaigns. That could be one way for forward that we have tried uh, together with sep sepsis fonden in Sweden. And actually the sepsis awareness among adults has increased since 2015 when we did the first uh, sepsis sur sur survey. Then 21% of adults we no knew about sepsis. Since then we have done uh, uh, se se several national campaigns and uh, trying to uh, inform med media about sepsis and also the gov government. And uh, the, the last survey we did this year was actually 49%. So there was a sig significant increase in the knowledge of sepsis. And we also uh, asked the pub public about other common uh, medical con con conditions and uh, the, the knowledge of these are very high in Sweden. Uh, approximately 90% knows about uh, acute my myocardial infarctions, breast cancer, stroke, prostate cancer, chronic obstructive lung disease, and so on. 
So this might be a way forward. And how could we improve the quality of sepsis management nationally? In 2019, the Swedish government cho chose sepsis as one, uh, one of the medical conditions for a national standardized healthcare process uh, that uh, are about to start now in 2021. And this includes uh, the implementation of sepsis alerts uh, in all uh, ho hospitals in Sweden and also fo follow-up clinics for sepsis. So this will be. This has been approved by the Swedish gov gov government and will be Im implemented this fall. And lastly, uh, how can we estimate the true burden of sepsis in Euro Euro Europe? And this is something that we're working on uh, within the European Sepsis uh, uh, Alliance, and we have come to the con conclusion that ICD coding is not the way for for forward. They are. Uh, too much underestimating the true burden. So we have to find a way to perform manual chart rev, uh, rev, reviews as well. And the, the EUSEP study will, now it uh, comprises uh, 14 or 15 uh, European countries and hopefully the, all European countries will be part of, of this study in, in the end. And the study is aiming at mapping the incidence of sepsis and also the clinical impact of AMR, AMR on uh, morbidity and mort mortality. So the key features of this study that, that we think might make it a su success, if, if you may, is that we use common definitions uh, of in infection. And this is kind of un un unique because in the sepsis definitions, there is no definition of infection, making uh, it hard to com com compare. Also, we have the common definitions of organ dis dysfunction proposed by the sepsis-3. And also, we base it partly on ICD coding, but we validate uh, the cohort uh, through manual chart review. And we have some results actually from a, a pilot from Sweden showing that it seems to be working. And what we found was in 2019, 4.6% of all hospitalizations in Sweden had sepsis 3 or fulfilled the sepsis 3 um, uh, cri cri criteria. So that's one in 20 patients actually either have sepsis when, when they are admitted to hospital or develop sepsis within the hospital stay. If we look at the R codes, that's the specific codes for sep sepsis, the incidence was 0.2. So uh, if you just look at the R codes, you are ser seriously uh, underestimating the true incidence of sep sepsis. And A codes, that's codes for different bac uh, bac bacteria and bloodstream in, in infection, then the in incidence was, was 1.5. And we, and we also that validated this, this in a smaller cohort from 2020. And also this year, the uh, sepsis-3 incidence was 4.6. And if you added COVID uh, uh, viral sepsis by, uh, you, caused by COVID, the incidence was 6.9. So from, here, from, from, from this data, we could calculate uh, the sepsis-3 in incidence in Sweden for 2019. And it was estimated actually to 1,360 per 100,000. So it's higher than pre previously an anticipated. And we also looked at the proportion of uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, found in blood cultures in, in these patients. And it was only present in 1% of, of the, the the sepsis cases in Sweden. So we have a relatively low uh, percentage of a a AMR causing sepsis. So a change is pos possible, we, we, we believe. We have increased, uh, at least in Sweden, the public uh, uh, awareness in six years from 20 to 50 per percent. Uh, there are sepsis alerts and post-sepsis clinics in introduced in the whole of Swed Sweden. And the use of pilot is a possible way for, forward to give us a true uh, burden of in sepsis uh, in incidence.
So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Linder, for providing us uh, with your initial uh, but very informative and inspiring remarks. Uh, I really like uh, the motto you uh, use, like a change is possible because we still need to be um, uh, always uh, positive and forward-looking as well. Um, so uh, I was really curious uh, to come across uh, this interesting data and thanks a lot for sharing this uh, uh, initial results of a, the pilot project in Sweden, which uh, certainly have set the ground for, for further thinking and actions in Europe. Uh, certainly these have uh, grasped my attention, but I hope also the one of the audience. And I also encourage the, uh, the people who, has, who are with, uh, with us today online to submit uh, their questions and also to share their ideas uh, in the chat box, because then I will uh, uh, go back to to eat uh, to, to this chat box uh, to collect some uh, relevant questions. Uh, first of all, an immediate question actually that I would like to uh, ask you, Dr. Linder. Uh, you um, pointed out uh, some um, very relevant keywords. Uh, uh, one of which is awareness. I truly believe that um, uh, much awareness and education are really critical success factors in tackling uh, this patient safety issue. Um, then you also um, mentioned all this data um, coming also from Sweden. But um, um, in your opinion, so how can health stakeholders uh, uh, better work together to enhance uh, uh, the management of sepsis in uh, healthcare settings in Europe? Yes, uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, yeah, I, th I think there is, is, is a lot of things that can be done. I mean, Again, why why is the burden difficult to es estimate? It, it's one thing is that bloodstream infection is not the same as sep sepsis. It's about twenty to thirty percent of sepsis cases have bacteria in the the blood. So we have to find other ways to measure sepsis as well in connection to uh, how uh, how we do to, uh, today with the bloodstream in, in, in infections. And as, as I said, the ICD code co coding is not working as it should. Um, and sepsis is not owned by one medical spe specialty. If a sepsis patient can turn, turn up at the, all different kinds of med medical and surgical wards. And in Sweden, for, for instance, only 7% of the sepsis patients end up in the ICU. So it's not only an ICU matter as, as well. The, the majority of the patients are in the regular wards or intermediate wards. And therefore, we also need to find, we need to adapt the sepsis definitions because they, are, uh, they only work well in the ICU. They don't, do, do not work well outside the, the I, I, ICU. And I think that's a key to also um, uh, be able to estimate the true burden. So we, we, we need to imp implement national sepsis management plans, increase uh, uh, awareness, uh, talk about the connection between sepsis and uh, antimicrobial res resistance. Uh, agree on a definition on in infection. That's also a problem that we have a con con condition, but we, 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 we do not ag agree on what it is. So we have to find a def definition for uh, se sepsis that all uh, uh, can uh, agree on more or, or less. So that's a few thoughts. And also e e electronic registration of vital parameters and also lab val values that would also be some kind of a future way to identify sepsis cases uh, in, in, in a way that we are not able to do to, today. Thank you, Dr. Linder. Um, uh, now, uh, really referring back to, to the um, link between sepsis and antimicrobial resistance, I would like also to hear um, uh, about the work uh, the uh, excellent uh, work that uh, Dr. Monet is uh, uh, carrying out at the ECDC. So uh, I would like also to give the floor now to Dr. Um, Dominic Monet, who again is the head of disease program on AMR and HAIs at the ECDC. 
So the floor is yours. Uh, and um, also, please, please to share also your screen. Dominic, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank, thank you, Laura, and uh, good afternoon, uh, colleagues and, and everybody. And it's, um, I think it was good to, that you put us in, in thinking mode. And ECDC has been working the past uh, almost 15 years on antimicrobial resistance and health gases in veterans, surveillance, prevention, control, as per our mandate. But you and uh, the organizers of this uh, webinar asked us questions, and I'm, I'm sorry that I often don't have the, the whole reply. So th this is a slide that I often use for health gases in infection. And it compares the, the defect per, per million. And we are, when we were traveling, we were taking planes and we had a short connection. And unfortunately, we would, you know, the, the luggage, we would make the connection, but the luggage would not make the connection. Well, that's about 0.7% of all luggage that would not make the, the connection. When we're talking about LK associated infections, it's about 7% of, of the patients that are hospitalized that will suffer the health gas of the infection. And then we saw higher numbers for, for sepsis, about one patient in, in 20 that would have a, a sepsis, at least in, in Sweden. So we get really annoyed about our lost luggage because we know what it is. We, we're aware it's something we experience all the time. And we're totally unaware about the rates of health gases infections and definitely those for uh, sepsis. So I was looking for, for data in our databases and what I could find is data on healthcare associated bloodstream infections. And we have performed at ECDC and the, the whole team and we've coordinated this with uh, all the EU EA countries and other countries and these are point prevalence surveys of health gases, infections, and antimicrobial use in European acute care hospitals <coughs> and also in long-term care facilities. And these were performed in 2016, 17. So on a given day in the EU EA, we ended up with the estimate that more than 10,000 patients have a healthcare associated BSI or bloodstream infection. And there are many more that have a community associated BSI, but these were not measured which means that each year in the EU EA, about 400,000 episodes of health care associated industrial infections. In the same survey, there was data on the, the level of uh, structures, processes, preparedness that the countries would have. 74% of the acute care hospitals had a guideline for the prevention of health care associated bloodstream infections in intensive care units. And 65% of the acute care hospitals had this kind of guideline that would cover the whole hospital. And for organized training for the prevention of health care associated uh, bloodstream infections, 54% of acute care hospitals would have such guidelines in intensive care units and 47% hospital wide. We tried a few years ago to calculate or estimate the burden of healthcare associated infections. And we were surprised to find out that healthcare associated infections in terms of burden in disability adjusted life years per population account for twice the burden of the other 31 infectious diseases that, that we deal with at ECDC. And you, you see the, the healthcare associated infections are, are here in, uh, in green on the screen. Because today we're talking about sepsis and we're talking about bloodstream infection, the healthcare associated primary bloodstream infections would be here and contribute to a very high burden, much more than all the other diseases. And again, these are just the healthcare associated bloodstream infections. When it comes to <coughs> antimicrobial resistance, uh, the burden of antimicrobial resistance, or more precisely, the burden of infections with antibiotic resistant bacteria, as reported by CDC, is comparable to the burden of influenza, tuberculosis, and HIV AIDS combined in disability adjusted uh, life years 
uh, per population. This is, of course, without taking into consideration COVID in, in 2020, and we, we may have updates for these numbers at some point. We're talking about 33,000 attributable death due to these infections with antibody resistant bacteria, or 170 disability adjusted life years per 100,000 population. And bloodstream infections, whether they are healthcare associated or community acquired due to antibody resistant bacteria, are responsible for most of a, of a burden of this uh, resistant infection. So that, that confirms with the discussion that we had previously. So what are the, my conclusions and, and reflections? Healthcare associated bloodstream infections, bloodstream infections with antimicrobial resistant bacteria, both result in a significant burden, human burden for, for the EU EEA. ECDC does not collect data on community acquired bloodstream infections or on sepsis. And there's a reason for this. It's because there's a list of communicable diseases and special health issues. And as per the legislation, these special health issues are nosocomial infections and antimicrobial resistance. And this list is what is the communicable diseases and the special health issues that the countries must report to ECDC. Sepsis is not a communicable disease. Sepsis is not included in the list, even as a special health issue. And in a hospital or other healthcare settings that it was mentioned, sepsis is not owned by one department. And I would say it's different from healthcare associated infections. In most hospitals now, there is an infection prevention control committee, and there is a unit of people that work full time on infection prevention control in the hospital to make sure that uh, to, to prevent and control healthcare associated infections, and that include antimicrobial resistance. We don't have this for sepsis. There's no sepsis committee, there's no sepsis unit. Second part of, the, of my reflections. We're able to, and this is your point, Adam, and I feel free to, to put it for, here forward again. We're able to communicate effectively to the general public on complex health issues, such as cancer, and to some extent about antimicrobial resistance, and we're getting better at this. So we should be able to communicate effectively about sepsis. But this is not as easy, we need to simplify the terminology and clarify the definitions. If the public hears about bloodstream infection, septicemia, bacteremia, and also about sepsis, the public will be, will be confused. Specifically for sepsis, we need a definition which is better understood and applicable to ongoing surveillance at the local, national, and EU level. Not sure it's possible, but you may get better estimates via the survey that you, you mentioned. My last point is, since 2008, we had a European Antibody Awareness Day. Since 2015, there's a World Antimicrobial Awareness Week that starts on the day that we had chosen for European Antibody Awareness Day, which is 18th of November. We started with a a small campaign, and so we, we need to, like you for sepsis, we, we need to raise awareness for the general public. And we had a, quite a small budget. And I would say any uh, research project now would start with a budget over several years of five to 10 million euros. For starting the campaign, we're using much less money now, but we used about 100,000 euros just for starting the campaign. We've had uh, movies, animation that were developed that have been translated with subtitles uh, in all the EU languages that have been used by member states. And then awareness was, was a snowball uh, st starting from this. So I'm sure it's possible. You, you, could, you could have a movie that said, look, you're feeling this way. You know, you, you don't feel well, you're tired, you're okay, and you put all your signs of sepsis, and this can, this can be uh, 
put on social media. This can be put even on TV channels as, as for antimicrobial resistance. So it's just an idea. It doesn't need to be fancy, but it's easy to do and it's easy to, to translate. And we'd be happy to talk to you if you want to mirror the, this idea on how to communicate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Monet, for uh, your uh, interesting uh, points and contributions to the debate. Now, conscious of the time, I just need to give the floor to uh, the member of the European Parliament, uh, Mr. Bouchoy. Thank you very much for being here with us today. I know that you also have another uh, important commitment, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I am in Berlin, a very important TPP meeting, and I'm not sure if the conditions are the best uh, for uh, this intervention. I'd like to thank ESA for inviting uh, today. In the last months, I have witnessed many discussions uh, on the implication of sepsis in the current pandemic response and evolution. But nevertheless, along uh, my activity in the parliament, I have participated in discussions on the link between the incidence of sepsis and antimicrobial resistance, of sepsis and healthcare associated infections, and between sepsis and patient uh, safety. We all know that healthcare associated infections are often resistant to antibiotics and can rapidly lead to deteriorating clinical conditions, and that the antimicrobial resistance is a major factor determining clinical unresponsiveness to treatment and rapid revolution, evolution to sepsis and septic shock. Moreover, there are many categories of patients that are at risk, especially those that are, of course, affected by an infection or those that have a serious precondition or have a non-communicable disease, the last one being also the major causing factor. These are discussions and facts that uh, we know at the level of policymakers. And of course, uh, it's important to know how we can contribute in order to support uh, your effort. And of course, the development of an action plan, because they understand that uh, this is one of the main discussions for today. My response would be by recognizing the problem, by making a priority for, from tackling sepsis, by addressing sepsis in the upcoming pharma strategy, where we'll be discussing about antimicrobial resistance as well. By raising awareness is what it was also mentioned by the distinguished uh, the professor and the experts uh, earlier, and also but by putting patient safety first. Sepsis is already recognized as an eligible action under the EU4 Health Program. Uh, I was and I am the rapporteur of the European Parliament for the EU4 Health Program in the specific actions to address healthcare associated infections and antimicrobial resistance. But of course, more needs to be done. The policymakers need your expertise and recommendations to support their actions and boost the development of the action plan. Implementing preventive measures against infections, such as good hygiene practices, and this was extremely important during coronavirus, uh, and I am sure that uh, medical staff, but and also the general public, is now more aware about this. Ensuring access to vaccination programs and vaccines uh, proved to be extremely efficient and the only the only solution to stop these pandemics. And of course, they are extremely important also for other diseases. Uh, infection prevention and control best practices, both in the community and healthcare settings, are key steps in reducing the occurrence of sepsis. Early diagnosis and timely and appropriate clinical management of sepsis, such as optimal antimicrobial use and fluid resuscitation are crucial to increase the likelihood of survival. Even though the onset of sepsis can be acute and poses a short-term mortality burden, it can also be the cause of significant long-term morbidity requiring treatment and support. Thus, sepsis requires a multidisciplinary approach. European Union, of course, uh, is committed to be more active in the health area. Of course, health remains a matter of subsidiarity. We cannot decide from European institutions what, how each member state are organizing their hospitals, their programs, their financing, but um, we, uh, there is a strong political support to involve more European institutions in the healthcare, to exchange best practices, to coordinate better among us, to have the best uh, approaches and the best strategies to be implemented all over in Europe to reduce the inequalities. We have you for health, we have the cohesion funds, we have also the uh, 
uh, uh, Horizon Europe, where health is extremely important and research can be done even in the, and also in the area of sepsis. So using this political commitment at the EU level, using the instruments that could be, could finance some of the initiatives and efforts, and also uh, putting uh, uh, all our experience together, I believe that uh, a good progress could be achieved in the coming years. Thank you so much and good luck in all your work. Many thanks, uh, uh, Mr. MEP Bourgeois. Thank you very much for providing these um, um, valuable comments. And um, you have uh, correctly explained all these uh, in major policy legislative files uh, with a view uh, really to uh, build a stronger and healthier, also more sustainable European Health Union. And also uh, at the European Sepsis Alliance, we really hope that uh, there will be a much better focus on research, on prevention, and also management of sepsis. Uh, um, and this would be uh, also um, uh, pursued by the, let's say, a stimulation of policies to prevent sepsis. Uh, and certainly we hope that uh, the uh, upcoming work plans uh, under the uh, European uh, for Health, uh, the EU for Health program, will basically provide the right also platform to uh, further support the research and education training programs for healthcare professionals on sepsis. So we really hope this will be uh, tackled not only um, uh, under this framework, but also within the pharmaceutical strategy for Europe and other major policy files. So thank you very much again. And uh, now I would like to go back and to open also a little bit uh, uh, the, this uh, Q&A session. I hope to make it more, uh, let's say, interactive also because uh, I've come across uh, very uh, interesting questions uh, from the audience. Uh, so I personally thank uh, the people who have submitted the question. Probably uh, I would like now to uh, go back to the presentation of Dr. Um, uh, Monet from the ECDC. And um, one of your um, reflections at the end uh, pointed out uh, the need to simplify the terminology and also to clarify the definitions. We know that uh, there is uh, the sepsis definitions um, by the WHO, which is also globally um, accepted. So how we can uh, really um, um, push, let's say, or uh, politely the member state uh, to implement uh, basically the, this common definition and also uh, how the EU institutions uh, can play a role to create awareness among the general public. Can you please uh, comment on this, uh, Dr. Monet? You are on mute. Sorry, if you can please unmute yourself. Thanks. Yes, I've done this for security. Um, yes, I mean, I think the, the study that you're planning to do and the, that you obviously pilot tested in, in Sweden, will promote the use of standardized def definitions. Um, so so this, this is essential. Now, if the study is only taking place in a few usual suspect countries, the one that have the resources and are motivated, and only in a few hospitals in those countries, well, that would not promote the use of, of a definition. So. I, I would uh, encourage you to enroll all EU member states and EA countries, all of them. I know that it's a first study, so I, you will not get a representative sample, but try to, to get as many regions as possible in, involved. Make, make that effort to enroll the, the people that would not have enrolled uh, initially. So I, I think they would find and like the discussion that we had to prepare this uh, webinar, where we were saying that people are accepting this WHO definition, so it's fine, but they need to be known. Uh, there is a, a comment in the chat about community acquired infection that cause 80% of all sepsis, but EDCDC does not have a mandate to, to do surveillance of those. So the cases of um, blostrum infections with strep pneumonia, and most of them, I mean, they're, they're all a community acquired, they will be measured, but they will be under strep pneumonia infection. We don't, we don't have that measurement of all bloodstream infections, only healthcare-associated infections. 
has to do with our mandate and has to do with the, the list of communicable disease under surveillance. Thank you for uh, this clarification, Dr. Monet. Well, we know um, uh, what is really um, evidence for us is that sepsis is intrinsically interlinked with AMR and healthcare associated infections, uh, because infections which do not respond to first line antimicrobial therapy due to AMR may progress to sepsis rapidly. So what we also aim to do and intend to, um, to do it actually next week, uh, I remind everyone that next Friday, uh, there is the World of Patient Safety Day 2021. So in this occasion, really, we uh, intend to um, better promote these messages because I think that we need to move in parallel um, and also really um, um, take uh, um, urgent steps and actions, uh, not only when it comes to sepsis, but linking to also um, uh, other uh, public health ch challenges. And certainly we uh, will be uh, really supportive of your work and uh, the upcoming uh, European Antibiotic Awareness Day on the 18th of November. Um, now, uh, I also have a, a question, actually. Uh, there was a question from the audience uh, to Dr. Uh, Linder. Uh, now, I will go back to it. Uh, so basically, before we mentioned a lot uh, the, the word awareness, uh, um, and here there is a, um, a question that says, beyond raising awareness and avoiding to be let's say, uh, more, you know, um, less uh, concrete when we talk about this uh, abstract com concept of awareness. Um, for the nurses and doctors, or for healthcare professionals, how um, is continuing professional development embedded in Sweden? And how are also the comp their competencies uh, verified and cross-checked? Yeah, this is a very... Um... Good question, and it's a serious task to, to do this. Uh, in Sweden so far, it's the emergency department and the pre-hospital, the am, am, ambulances that are affected um, with this sepsis uh, alert implementation. And so in each province in Sweden, we have a sepsis coordinator, and they have a team, and they, they are responsible for uh, appointing local sepsis um, officers or responsibles and 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 they have specific training pro programs for their staff the next step is that we want to implement this to to identify sepsis also in 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 the different wards and then there will be a, a huge amount of staff that needs to be trained so this this will cost money, but it will also save lives. So I think in the end, we will earn money. Yes. Thank you, Adam. Well, um, conscious again of the time, I wish we would talk more and, and learn more uh, from you uh, because you are really expert in, the, in this field. I, uh, we arrive at the end of our uh, panel discussion. Um, I, I truly thank you for being here, for providing these uh, uh, presentations, uh, which uh, have been very uh, inspiring and informative, in my opinion. And I hope um, also that the audience has truly enjoyed the discussion as well. Uh, certainly, the presentation will be available, and as well as, I guess, uh, the recording. So uh, we can certainly follow up on, on some very interesting point you raised uh, in the near future. So again, thank you very much. And now I will hand the floor back to um, Madame um, Ulrika, please. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for all of you uh, for this very interesting discussion. Um, so the uh, next topic, uh, the next um, panel debate will be uh, patient centric health systems, uh, leveraging lessons from long COVID and sepsis patients. Uh, and uh, the moderator for this panel discussion will be Silvio uh, Girardi, who is uh, representing the association Association Dossetti in Italy. And Dossetti have uh, done some remarkable work in Italy to raise awareness about sepsis amongst the scientific community and politicians. So warm welcome to you, Silvio, and I'll leave uh, the introduction of the panelists in this discussion to you. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ulrika. Can you hear me well? 
Yes, definitely. <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay, my name is uh, Silvio Gerardi. Unfortunately, you know, uh, in English, G E H is G, but in Italian, is G H uh, is G. So my right name is Gerardi. Uh, Sorry about that. Want... No, no problem. Uh, when I have been living in the States, everybody used to call me Gerardi. <laughs> so it's, I'm, I'm acquainted with this. Um, I want to thank you, ESA, for inviting me, giving the honor of uh, chairing this section. Um, this is a very important point that we have, uh, how we can uh, involve patients, uh, how we can inform patients when it comes to um, sepsis and particularly to COVID. Uh, we have uh, three speakers tonight, Elisa Perego, Christiane Hertog, and hopefully I can pronounce the names correctly, and Ulf Bodeschel. Um, I would like to ask uh, um, Elisa to start with her uh, presentation. Uh, Elisa is an honorary research associate at the University College of London, and she has been involved in uh, a lot of research on health, disability, and inequality. Uh, she was as well in Lombardia, in the north of Italy, when the uh, big pandemic uh, uh, strike happened in, uh, in Italy. Um, Elisa? I think uh, we have to uh, start with uh, Christiane. Yeah, okay. uh, Elisa is not quite here yet, so. Okay, uh, so Christiane, she is a physician sepsis researcher and lecturer at the uh, Charité Berlin, and she's coordinating the ESA working group on patients and family support. Thank you, Christiane. You have 10, 15 minutes. First of all, I want to thank the organizers for this interesting meeting and the opportunity to speak on behalf of the European Sepsis Alliance Patient and Family Support Working Group. Um, it, is a, uh, it is a pity that we have not yet listened to Elisa's talk, but I can tell you it is very moving to hear from not only a patient and a sepsis survivor, but of a patient who has kind of empowered herself and uh, thought and developed a name for what she was experiencing. Now, why is this important? I am a general practitioner by training. I have been working with sepsis patients and family members for many years. And patients' stories are important input because they remind us that the first and foremost goal of medicine is to put and keep patients in the central focus. Sepsis and COVID highlight the weaknesses and the deficits of healthcare systems. And these weaknesses and deficits are appalling. Elisa's story is that, and I hope she can tell you herself, that she was left alone. It is unique, but it is also typical for numerous other sepsis survivors. She has been left alone to understand her problems of persisting health problems, of ongoing weakness, of fatigue, of failure to breathe properly, and so on. She has been left alone to make a sense of what is happening. And she has been left alone to put a name to it. And she invented the name Long COVID. And I must say that listening to her story, I've listened to her story before. I was very impressed by what she has achieved. And I must tell you, if you blame such problems, her problems on the pandemic only, then you are wrong. Her problems are typical they are a structural problem. It's the story of numerous sepsis survivors. And they will tell you 
actually it should be the duty of the medical profession, of the doctor, of the family doctor, of the clinician in the hospital, of the nurses, to help us cope and understand and name our problems to become well again. But this is very often not happening. And I want you to remind you of the scope of this problem. Uh, the number is published. Uh, we have 700,000 sepsis survivors in Europe per year. But listening to Adam Linder's talk just now, where he found that many cases are not recorded, this is probably grossly underestimated. And now we also have 39 million COVID survivors in Europe to date. New research suggests that the majority of hospital-treated sepsis survivors and about half of hospital-treated COVID survivors suffer from ongoing persisting problems. And these are called post-sepsis morbidity, sepsis sequela, or in the case of COVID, which severe COVID is viral sepsis, long COVID or post-COVID syndrome. Our research from German data suggests that about 75% of hospitalized sepsis survivors suffer from post-sepsis morbidity. 25% are newly dependent on nursing care. And remember, sepsis can affect everyone, not only the aged or the very young, but also people in their best years, 30, 40, 50 year old people, and they are suddenly thrown back and they are like instant aging, someone has said, feels like 80 years old, dependent on nursing care. And over 30% die in the following year. Other problems are repeated admissions into hospital, often for recurring infections and a new sepsis episode. So what must be done? I want to cite the parents of Rory Staunton. You may have heard of Rory. He was a 12-year-old healthy schoolboy from New York who died from sepsis because neither the pediatrician who was called nor the emergency doctor they went to recognized the warning signs and symptoms of sepsis. This boy could have been saved like many others. And his death led to the implementation of the Rory Staunton regulations, the mandated sepsis protocols in 149 New York State hospitals. And you know that this resulted in a drastic decrease of hospital mortality and probably an increase of recognized sepsis cases. And the parents of Rory have now written an editorial accompanying an epidemiologic study of pediatric sepsis in the critical care journal. And this is their message. They say, we are not waiting for a drug against sepsis. We are waiting for political leadership. And this is my message also today. We are asking for political leadership in the European Union, which is the courage to put solutions that are already out there. We have published them over the years and you can read them and they are stated and they are put into protocols and everything. So these solutions are there. We do not need to find them. These solutions must be put into practice. Politicians must invest in sepsis in education of the public as well as in education of the medical profession. And the time for volunteers is over. Progress so far has been mainly achieved by volunteers, but patients and family members uh, have the right and they demand that this is now becoming professionalized, political leadership. And we must foster new treatment concepts of post-sepsis problems that are overarching across medical fields and bridge medical silos to answer the needs of parents, of patients and families. 
So it is inspiring that in our working group, we have patient representatives from Sweden, Norway, Belgium, France, the UK, Germany, and other countries who do not turn their back on this horrible experience they underwent, but leverage their experience to seek to improve the condition for future patients and family members. We have drafted a statement, which you can read on the European Sepsis Alliance website, to political leaders and policymakers on the demands of patients and families. Now, just want to cite the demands that patients and families have. Training of medical personnel. Acute care according to best evidence guidelines. Improved communication between doctors and patients and families about sepsis and long-term effects of sepsis. Structured aftercare according to quality indicators. Multidisciplinary rehabilitation, coverage by insurance, and funding for clinical research and quality improvement. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Christiane. Uh, I think you gave us uh, two very important messages. One is uh, very encouraging, and that is we do not need new drugs or new uh, therapeutic tools for treating uh, sepsis. The second one is a little bit worrying instead, because uh, we need leadership and education. Um, you pointed out very well that leadership should come from politicians. And uh, in my country, but I believe in Europe, all over Europe, we are still lacking this leadership. Probably we were not able to sensitize the political class on how important it is to manage uh, sepsi. Uh, by the way, this is one of the key activity that we in the uh, Associazione Dossetti try to do with the Italian uh, politicians. And the second part of this is the education to doctors, patients, and I would say the press as well, uh, the journalists, because, you know, um, sepsi is considered sometimes as a a uh, strange disease, very far from us, on the normal living, and uh, everybody believes that sepsis is not touching us, is not involving us, which is absolutely not true. So thank you for the two messages, and hopefully uh, the other two speakers will uh, uh, expand the concept of leadership as well as the concept of education. Um, I don't know if uh, we now have, uh, uh, thank you again, Elisa, or should we move on with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Bodeschel? I think I can see Elisa here I, now. Yeah. Uh, okay. My apologies uh, for that before. I went into the wrong room, but I don't know why. And uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, excellent opportunity to talk about uh, long COVID and the rights uh, of people uh, with uh, chronic illnesses and disabilities. Uh, a bit of a background about long COVID, as uh, we know, unfortunately, uh, long COVID, the long-term health effects of uh, SARS-CoV infections um, are now, is now recognized as a major clinical and social challenge in this pandemic. And uh, long COVID is a patient-made term which emerged across uh, the first pandemic month uh, among patient people affected by COVID-19 first. Just a bit of the background, many of you might remember that at the beginning of the pandemic, we were told that uh, people were supposed to recover from COVID-19 in two to six weeks, mild to severe COVID. But actually, this is what uh, this is what uh, it was not happening. Many people stay ill 
for many, many months. We now know that millions of people, it is estimated that millions and millions of people across the world are suffering from COVID-19 long-term effects. And uh, many people <laughs> like myself are still ill after uh, like uh, one year and a half after the initial infection. As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, at the beginning, policymakers and medical professionals were not recognizing the fact that people were not recovering so fast from COVID-19. And it was uh, about uh, patients taking things into their hands and connecting uh, to each other through social media, such as Twitter, the press, uh, Facebook, and so on. So uh, the idea of long COVID, of the fact that people were not recovering, travel from patient to policymakers in the medical field. This was the, the main root of uh, the recognition of long COVID. And uh, so patients uh, built uh, an international uh, grassroots uh, movement of people that achieve some significant success, such as formal recognition from uh, the World Health Organization in August 2020, that is last year. Patients also organize themselves uh, in collectives uh, and um, um, uh, groups that are often in working uh, as uh, research jobs. Do you, can you hear me? I see a message. Uh, can you hear me well? Uh, Sometimes there is uh, some noise in the background. You may want to try oh. to speak a little bit louder. Okay, my apologies. Maybe it's my internet not working well. So basically, uh, after um, almost two years uh, of um, working uh, in science communication, advocacy and research on long COVID, I would like uh, to share some ideas uh, that uh, come to mind and uh, really build on uh, what uh, Cristiane and Professor Gerardi shared with us um, for now. So what uh, patients need? with the long COVID, with COVID-19 sequelae. First of all, the creation of uh, appropriate um, medical codes and uh, care pathways for treatment, for recognition. And these are to be um, linked to the lived experience of people who had COVID-19 and are suffering from long COVID. And the fact that patients have been so involved in advocacy and research since the beginning of the pandemic, it is interesting because it gives us the idea that patients can be expert on their own medical condition. And this is an idea that could be exported to other uh, chronic illness communities, such as, for example, uh, sepsis, of course, uh, and many others. A second very important point uh, that Christian mentioned and others have mentioned as well is about uh, leadership and research funding. We need research funding to study long COVID because we have a new virus and a new disease. And the funding must be commiserated to the disease burden. And we know that, unfortunately, this is huge. Millions of people are suffering from long COVID. Again, uh, patients should be, in my opinion, strongly involved in the creation and design of research projects. This is because we have a new disease and patients have been collecting data and sharing data since the beginning of the pandemic. Often we have clinical data that the researchers still do not have because we do exam, medical exam ourselves and we share the data across multiple media. 
And again, this kind of, of uh, research, patient-centered, could be um, exported, let's say, to other chronic illness communities, such as the sepsis and post-infection chronic illness community. It is also important, in my opinion, that um, uh, services and healthcare pathways are also informed by patients and the input of patients. Uh, I will note that many medical professionals and care professionals do have long COVID because obviously they contracted uh, COVID-19 in the hospital while working. And this is, so basically uh, medical professionals are often both patients and doctors. And this can provide uh, peculiar and very important uh, input into um, service uh, design and the provision of care. We are also thinking about long COVID as a disability where in countries where it's not recognized as a disability. And uh, I want to mention that uh, long COVID is a disease which is often severe, energy limiting. Some days uh, you are really ill, you can't really work uh, very well. Some patients are really, really severe. And I think this is the case of many uh, sepsis survivors as well. So um, I think we really need uh, to think about uh, disability services and access to disability services, including benefits that are really, you know, targeted to the needs of patients. And this is especially the case in a pandemic where, you know, you may <laughs> risk uh, infection with SARS-CoV-2 infection, et cetera, for traveling, face-to-face -face appointments, and so on. And uh, I would like uh, to conclude uh, mentioning that pandemics uh, are, uh, you know, history altering events. And often, you know, they bring obviously huge disruption, social disruption, but sometimes they can also bring a change. And this pandemic has brought about a more uh, like in the case of long COVID, more awareness of uh, chronic illness, uh, the need for accommodation, the need, for example, for smart working, uh, um, you know, online conferences and so on, these kind of things. We have so, so thus, an opportunity to build a better society in this time of crisis. And this can involve, of course, uh, many other chronic illness communities such as sepsis or survivor. I hope this opportunity will be taken. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Elisa, for your speech. Sometimes we had some trouble in hearing you, so hopefully uh, all the messages that you have passed through have been uh, perceived by uh, the audience. I think there are three points very important among the others. Number one is uh, money for research. Research is a key element uh, in any disease, particularly when it comes for, to a disease like COVID that, that is not yet well known. Actually, it was totally unknown. And that was an issue. Um, I think that there are... Uh, monies, a lot of money in Europe and in the world in research for COVID. But one of the problem is that we do not have a coordination uh, among the research centers. So the risk is that the money that are ma made available either by the government or the uh, donations uh, are not all focused to the same target. And uh, the Latin used to say divide et impera. Uh, uh, that may means in this case, if you divide the money, you do not get enough funds for a outstanding research. And, and then it comes to leadership as well, because leadership is not only in politics, but it is as well in research. The second point is the involvement of patients in the research 
And I think this is really a key element. You said very well that patients know the disease probably better than physicians. They do not know the terminology. They do not know maybe the diagnosis or uh, the therapy. But the way they describe the disease is uh, for handbook of medicine. So we should listen to them more and more. And finally, this is a real long-term issue for COVID. Maybe COVID will disappear in the near future, we don't know, but what is sure, it may not disappear, the disability issue. Uh, a key question is, is this a temporary disability? Is this a permanent disability? We don't know yet, because from what I know, um, we have information that disability may last for about 12 months, but we do not know, at least I do not know, uh, if we have uh, cases that is long, lasting longer going into chronic issue. And maybe this may, may be a question to rise to you guys, uh, to the speakers, uh, is do you believe that COVID uh, may become a permanent disability issue for patients? Uh, let me move now to Ulf Bodekschel. Ulf is a doctor, is a neurologist and co-director of the uh, thank you, uh, Elisa, and co-director of the Interdisciplinary Center for Intensive Care, Long-Term Treatment and Acute Rehabilitation of the Kreisha uh, Germany Hospital. Uh, they are very much involved in a comprehensive care structure for patients in, under rehabilitation. And since 2018, they partner in treating patients with severe sepsis. Dr. Ulf Böreschel, please. You have 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, thank you very much for the instruction. Uh, as you mentioned, I am a neurologist. I work in the Kreischer. Just a moment, please. Uh, I forgot some slices. Um, as you can see on the right side, this is Germany. And here in the very east, this is Saxony, and in the east of Saxony, uh, this is this the region, East Saxony, it's a very rural area. There live about one and a half million people, and over the uh, half of them live in the area here around Dresden. This is the University Hospital in Dresden, uh, um, which is the biggest hospital in the region, and has already uh, different networks with different hospitals in this area. Uh, for example, a cancer network or a stroke network. And um, here in the south of Dresden is the Bavaria Clinic in Kreischer. This is the largest rehabilitation center for neurological diseases. And we have focused since the last 20 years on patients with critical illness polyneuropathy. We are a big weaning center and so we have uh, lots of experiences with patients uh, with um, sequelae after sepsis. Um, I started here uh, in 2016. Uh, for that time um, I was uh, at the University Hospital in Dresden um, and when I came here uh, the idea came up uh, to implement also a comprehensive sepsis center like to other organ diseases. And therefore, uh, the first step was um, that we developed a treatment pathway, multi-professional and interdisciplinary treatment pathway um, with the University Hospital in Dresden and uh, with our clinic. Uh, for example, in this treatment pathway, uh, um, we implemented an early warning system as well as a screening instrument for uh, all emergency rooms uh, at the University Hospital. Um, and we implemented all these, the whole pathway in 2019. We also uh, started to do teaching courses about sepsis with an interdisciplinary approach. Uh, we had teaching courses for nurses, for uh, therapists, and for medical doctors. And we did it uh, before COVID all 
also all together. Uh, at the moment, we do it online. And we implemented the quality management. So, for example, uh, we measure continuously different uh, quality indicators and uh, we discuss uh, them every uh, quarterly uh, in, in, in case discussions uh, to learn about the quality of the treatment uh, within the farm. Then uh, we um, we accompanied an observational study uh, to evaluate this project. Um, this is a single center evaluation obs observational study. Um, this is funded by the Code Goldstein Institute. And uh, within uh, this study, we included also uh, follow-up questioning uh, at different time points at three months and at 12 months. Um, at the beginning in 2020, uh, we had implemented all these things and we started uh, to treat patients within this pathway. The vision is, of course, uh, in the future uh, to, to expand this uh, pathway to the preclinical treatment and prevention as well to the follow-up care. At the moment, we included only the hospital treatment at the University Hospital in Dresden and the rehabilitation at my clinic. Um, I will give you some results for the discussions. Um, we started in February 2020, and for this session, uh, I made an analysis uh, in August, and at this time point, we included uh, 386 patients prospectively in this observational study. And as you can see here, we had 177 patients with sepsis after COVID and 191 patients with sepsis without COVID. Um, as you can see here, the median age was not different in both groups but there was a significant difference uh, in the severity of the diseases uh, measured by the septic shock incidence by admission. Um, the patient with COVID-19 uh, associated sepsis uh, had a higher BMI and had uh, more diseases previously measured by the Charleston Comorbidity Index. Um, on the right side, you can see the all-over mortality, which was very high, 44% uh, uh, within three months died um, after including into this observational study. And there was a significant difference between the both subgroups, COVID and non-COVID. In the COVID group, almost 60% died, and in the non-COVID group, 29%. Um, at the moment, we are evaluating um, different uh, findings, uh, if we can, can find um, other uh, things that can help us to understand the difference between those groups. And here are uh, the short results for the three-month follow-up. Um, all, of all patients, 260, uh, 206 uh, were discharged from the University Hospital in Dresden, 46 at home, three to a care facility, 25 to our clinic. Uh, that means uh, these patients got the structured treatment pathway in our clinic, and 13 uh, patients went to another uh, rehabilitation facility. And in this prelim preliminary analysis, uh, uh, we could see um, the patients who have passed the structured treatment pathway may have a better treatment outcome in terms of quality of life. After three months, the people who have passed this pathway, had a better quality of life than the other people. Um, they had a higher reintegration into normal living 
and they had less uh, severity of chronic fatigue symptoms. Um, the number of the patients is too small to make a statistic analysis. This is only a trend, but we are going on with this study to learn more about the, con uh, the effect from the structured treatment pathway in septic patients. So my conclusion is uh, that the tra treatment of sepsis patients at a, a comprehensive sepsis center is possible. And it's also possible to, an, to get an overview of the treatment quality in this center. And uh, we think that continuously collected results uh, help us to understand the optimal course of the treatment, to measure the, the quality of the treatment in the center, and it will help us to improve the treatment quality continuously. The first results regarding the long-term outcome after surviving sepsis are very encouraging. Um, however, these results are not significant due to the low number of cases at this time point, Aber, but we are going on to evaluate the study. Um, the plan is to have data from 300 patients after one year outcome data. So thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Doctor. Uh, I have one question for you. Uh, that is, uh, do you have an idea on how important is an early treatment, as early as possible, in terms of prevention of a later development of sepsis? In other words, if we are able to treat patients at the first symptoms, uh, is this a preventing action activity? in order to sepsis, or even if we start treatment as early as possible, they may go into sepsis as well. And the second question is, um, you show us that mortality was about 50% for, uh, sorry, 60% for uh, COVID patients and 30% for other patients. Uh, though you said you are still uh, analyzing data, but, uh, um, what, what may be the reason for this? Um, to the first question, um, I'm a stroke neurologist. Um, and in stroke neurology, uh, we say time is brain. The earlier the therapy, the better the outcome. And it's the same for me in septic patients. Uh, and we saw in our uh, analysis, in our um, in our case discussions, uh, the earlier we treat the patients, uh, uh, the better is the outcome. Um, and I think we have to focus, this is one of the main problems, we have three emergency rooms uh, at the University Hospital. And the goal is uh, to implement a tool that every septic patient um, can be assessed very early and can get the correct treatment as soon as possible. I'm with you. This is the most important thing. No? Uh, to the second question, um, we saw the statistically significant difference between those two groups. The, the COVID patients had significant more uh, thrombotic complications, such as pulmonary embolism. This may be a cause, um, um, and the other uh, things are still under investigation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there any question from the audience for this section? Um, uh, yes. No. Yeah, go read. No, sorry. So, no, continue. <laughs> no, no. I read. Uh, in the chat, a question, if there are any difference in the outcome of uh, non-immunized survivors as compared to the breakthrough COVID survivors, uh, the number we have is too small. We cannot say this yet, but uh, we are very interested in, in getting more uh, Results in this topic. Another quest, good question is, uh, is the difference uh, 
Um, is the outcome, not only the survival is different in COVID and non-COVID, but is the outcome of the survivors also different? I can't answer this yet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other question or intervention? Uh, well, before we conclude, um, let me uh, try to point out one issue in Europe uh, as far as COVID is concerned. Uh, what I see, and I think we all see, is that there is no coordination whatsoever among the different countries when it comes to COVID. There are countries where uh, vaccination is mandatory or very close to being mandatory. Other countries where the so-called green pass or vaccination pass is again mandatory. Um, countries where the quarantine is requested, but maybe five days or 10 days. Now, the key points here is that once more, Europe, it is not yet one country. What can we do in order to make Europe one country, at least when it comes to healthcare? Does anybody have an idea or suggestion about this? Um, I would like to say something here, if I may. Please. Um, but going back to uh, the parents of Rory Staunton, uh, I think political leadership for is to, to put solutions into practice. I think we must not fall into the trap of looking into differences and special problems and um, maybe unique uh, uh, problems, but look at the common, um, the common underlying problems and, and solutions. Uh, Dr. Bodechtel um, uh, showed us an example of how a multimodal therapy, which includes um, all medical, physical, and uh, mental disciplines, which is very unusual for a rehabilitation clinic, um, is put into practice to uh, help uh, patients after COVID and sepsis uh, to regain their health again. And this is not, this is a unified, this is an overarching solution, which is known for a long time. This is what patients need. And I think if we ask uh, the European Union to support these findings and suggestions that we have, then these would apply to all European countries in the same manner. And they would apply as well to COVID as to sepsis uh, survivors from other sources be it bacterial sepsis or viral sepsis, for instance, from influenza. Um, I think we also ignore uh, the, the problems, the perennial problems we have with the survivors from influenza, in, influenza sepsis. So I think we can, if we want to move forward, we need to focus on these overarching and common solutions for, as a common denominator for the problem of treating patients after sepsis. Uh, Sylvia, I think we need to wrap your little panel up, if you if you may. Uh, we have some final questions too that we might have to address uh, after this. Do you have anything more you'd like to add uh, in this group? No, I would say no. Uh, I think we can consider this completed uh, almost on time, Ulrika. Mm. Very good. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, all of you. Um, before we uh, wrap this day up a bit, um, there's been some questions that I just to see, can see if we can get some answers for. Um, there was a question about... Uh, 
uh, AMR and and how uh, this problem with uh, antibiotic uh, being the basically the only treatment for sepsis. Uh, is there any new uh, treatment? Um, how, how long will we have to wait before there might be some new treatment? I think maybe Adam, uh, is this something uh, that the research group have been uh, talking about? Um, if, if, there's, if you have any comments on that. Is, is there any new um, treatment for sepsis in the pipeline or should we have to wait for decades to come before we have anything else than antibiotic? to use when when treating sepsis. Are you still with us, Adam? Maybe not. Okay. Anyone else feel free to ask, <laughs> answer the question. <laughs> no? Okay, let's let's leave that then. Um, well, thank you all for uh, participating. Uh, we are now uh, heading towards the end of this, this day. Um, uh, and I would like to introduce our last speaker, uh, Daniela uh, Filipesco, who is uh, Vice Chairman of the ESA. I will let you, Daniela, give some final uh, remarks and conclusions uh, to the discussions that we've had here today. Yes, before uh, the closure, I would like to, to say a few uh, words. First of all, thank you for uh, uh, you for moderating uh, the session, the, the event. Uh, I, I'm so happy that we had this event today and I would like to, to thank all the participants, uh, the speakers and the colleagues for their engagement in the fourth annual meeting of the European Sepsis Alliance. Uh, we uh, at the European Sepsis Alliance are proud to see how much progress we are doing together uh, towards raising awareness about sepsis and implementation of the 2017-2017 uh, uh, World Health Assembly Resolution on improving uh, the prevention, diagnosis and management of sepsis. The report we launched today on the European Sepsis uh, Initiatives is a demonstration of what concrete measures can be put in place to uh, improve uh, the management of sepsis, uh, mitigate uh, its harm and eventually save people's life. Uh, we hope uh, it will be helpful for other countries uh, to find inspiration and for European institutions and stakeholders at large to keep track of the uh, progress. Our call to the European institution is to support the sharing of knowledge amongst member states, but we also would like to see European guidelines for the management of sepsis, a comprehensive European infection management program, and EU funding for uh, sepsis research. Uh, this should go uh, hand in hand with the extended powers of European institutions and the authorities in the area of health. In this sense, we are uh, supportive of the extension of the ACDC mandate, as we believe national health authorities and professionals need guidance and support in tackling the heavy burden of sepsis on our society. Today we have talked about the need to integrate sepsis into national health systems and programs to make them stronger and more uh, resilient. We discussed solutions to fill in the knowledge gap we have heard from the patients and how important it is to support them also after hospital dismissal uh, to mitigate the long-term effects of sepsis. Uh, it has been said uh, many times today, and uh, I think it's important to reiterate that uh, this pandemic is contributing to the uh, increase uh, of the global burden, uh, burden of sepsis. And if we estimate that to date there are more than uh, 36 uh, million COVID-19 survivors who potentially could be facing the long-term effects of the disease, similarly to post-sepsis syndrome, the public health problem is huge. COVID-19 is not uh, the only co cause of sepsis in Europe. We are missing solid data in order to quantify and better manage sepsis. Uh, we have heard uh, that sepsis is not uh, uh, the, in the scope of ECDC. Uh, however, we hope that with the extension of its mandate, sepsis could also find a space in, uh, in it. Meanwhile, 
the European Sepsis Alliance is working on a Europe-wide uh, survey to assess the quality of care of sepsis in Europe, and we have already launched it uh, uh, recently. Uh, and uh, we hope to collect as many data as possible from uh, participating countries all around Europe. Here I invite our colleagues to participate and contribute to this ambitious project. So please contact us uh, if you would like to uh, contribute. We would like uh, to continue these uh, discussions uh, with all of you, and especially we need the uh, engagement of the authorities. We have heard about the goals of the Slovenian presidency of the EU Council and the measures uh, underway proposed by the European Commission to answer to this crisis and the future ones. We have also heard uh, of the great progress undertaken by countries like uh, France in setting up a national action plan on sepsis. And we hope that the French presidency uh, of the EU EU Council will continue in the first semester of 2022 on the basis of the work done so far to put sepsis on the agenda of the EU. Let me uh, thank you all uh, one more time for the participation today to our amazing speakers and moderators uh, from whom we have all learned a lot, to my colleagues, uh, physicians, nurses, and other professionals for the undeniable and daily effort in managing uh, the pandemic and sepsis uh, and save people's life, to patients and their families for helping us to reach our uh, mandate. I thank our members and coordinators for the continued work and support throughout the years to the European institutions supporting our endeavor towards a Europe free of sepsis. As Dr. Hans Kluge, the director of WHO Europe said today, we know what is needed. Let's make it happen. What a nice slogan for the celebration of the Sepsis Day on September uh, 13. A number of events in different countries are organized, so please find the ones close to your heart and uh, engage. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you, Daniela. And thank you everyone for participating and listening to us today. Uh, I hope you've had an enlightening afternoon. And I would like to uh, remind you that uh, the recording of today's event will be available on the ESA website soon. And um, I would also like to remind you that the ESA report that we've been talking about, uh, that can also be found on the ESA websites. And don't forget the upcoming World Sepsis Day on Monday, the 13th of September. There will be events going on all around Europe. So uh, try and find, as Daniela said, a, a local event close to you. And we also would like to encourage you to uh, follow and interact with the European Sepsis Alliance on Twitter. I hope you all have enjoyed our program today and I wish you a very pleasant evening. Thank you.